get gotten with Mike and we're gonna you know grab pizza, come back in and uh, we'll show that 53 minute runtime. We we set 70 minutes for lunch. So um the really important thing, the beer reception tonight at five o'clock in the Tuscany foyer. So the shuttle buses are running. Um, we will strive to adjourn by 4.30 so that you can get back to the hotel and then dump your stuff and come down and have a beer. In the back of the room, Carl Neiman, with video missions here in Reno, does a lot of work for us. And so Carl's filming. Um, we're recording the Zoom, but then we also have this owl unit that sort of finds the speaker. It'll be trained mostly on the podium. So um, name badges. Registration, if you haven't already picked yours up, you can get it during one of the breaks. And tonight is the Welcome Back to Reno party. And I mentioned this yesterday. You know, if you're an exhibitor or if you're a registrant, you can get in. If folks are neither, come and talk to me and maybe we can figure something out how to get you in tonight. I've got a limited number of passes because we've already given a meal count to the hotel. So if anybody has any logistic questions about the sheep show and what's going on, try to grab me and I'll, we'll get you answered. So anything else before we turn over to Daryl and kick this thing off? Again, welcome. Thanks to all the presenters for putting this together. It's gonna be really, really a cool day. And there's enough agendas if folks you still need them. Daryl Lutz from Wyoming Game of Fish, who's the Chair of the Wild Sheep Initiative, formerly known as the Wild Sheep Working Group, but it's still the Wild Sheep Working Group. We'll call it that, just like everybody still calls us Menage. Yep. <laughs> the change comes hard. Good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to the, the Test and Remove Workshop 2.0, as Kevin said. This is a follow up, but I don't think it's likely to be the last workshop we have to talk about Test and Remove. There's quite a bit quite a few more jurisdictions that are starting to tinker with it, to implement it. We're going to hear from some of those folks today. So I would anticipate, especially as um, more information becomes available, we're going to want to probably do this in some fashion, perhaps again in a couple of years. Um, Kevin mentioned that there was a group of folks, of course, that put this together. It takes a team to do these kind of things. Um, and that included We are going to pass around a sign up machine as well. Okay, right here. Okay, just start it. Yeah, so while Carl's doing that, please know the rest of the microphones. We do need to use mics today so that when it comes time for questions, we've got two mics. Maybe. Check, 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 check. That'll be running around the room. So hold your questions till you have a mic in hand. I'm so not going to run around the room. So what did you say? I'm not going to run around the room. Oh, did I say Mike's going to run around? <laughs> Somebody's going to run around the room. Mike's, Mike's oh, we've got two mics. I'm just kidding. We can't have more than one mic off, for God's sake. So anyway, I just want to thank Tom Besser, Francis Casier, Mike Cox, Clint Nepps, Kevin, Kate Highbard. I hope I pronounced that right. Did I? <laughs> um, no. Hybert. <laughs> Hybert. Sorry, Kate. Kate, are you here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, Nate LaHue, Todd Mordine, Helen Swanchi. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, okay. Oh, dang it. Kylie, right? Kylie? I'm going to remember eventually. Kylie Thacker and, of course, Terry Wolf. So thank them when you get a chance to see them. We put a lot of work into this, and I think you're going you're gonna to find today to be every bit as beneficial as the workshop that we held in 2021. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to keep us on schedule today, and we have a lot of talks prepared for you. Um, so what I didn't do is, and, and because I'm still learning a lot of, of about the folks whom I'm going to be working with, with the Wild Sheep Initiative or the working group, I didn't get biographies from each of you, so I would ask that you just take a minute or two at the beginning of your presentations and introduce yourselves. With that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. It's always great to get started a little bit early, um, but it's always great to start out with a change in the agenda, right? And it's going to be a change right at the get-go. We decided that it might flow a little bit better if Helen 
um, talked about culling for other species um, and test and remove. So with that, Helen's going to start us off, and then we'll move to Francis. Thanks, Helen. Yeah. And Mike says there's 76 people online so far. So good for now. Francis is nervous. Yes. Thank you all for coming. Can you hear me okay? Is my hair good? You know, now that I'm a star. And uh, honestly, I'm not the star in this film. It's a star. Very closer into the mic. Um, the Carl, projector. Could you do my makeup, please? <laughs> oh, wait. Uh, and could we have the projector on? That would be. Um, what I'm starting with, the reason I'm starting is I want to do an overall view. I know there are vets in the audience and you have a pretty good background on how to control infectious disease. The biologists here, not so much. And I want you to see that uh, this technique actually fits under an umbrella of a very well recognized method of control. All the guys that are there. And it's, it's occurred in many, many different species, including livestock and domestic animals. So I want you to see that. Um, I'm going to be quite quick for the first slides. They're big, they're complex, and we're going to flip through those quite quickly. If we can get the presentation up. That's a simple one. But so while we're doing that, I just okay. want to you're, mention that your life, Mike, you need to that Helen's talk is is not what you're seeing on the agenda that you've got in front of you, but it's methods of controlling infectious animal diseases, testing, cold, slash remit. There are three uh, co-authors of this talk, um, and uh, you can read the names, and I appreciate their help very much. Biography. I'm the former wildlife vet of BC. I was a past member of the working group, and I'm currently a member of the Professional Resource Advisory Board. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this well, okay, hang on. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. Can we? Can people hear me on Zoom now? I do. Okay, that's great. I'll stop yelling. <laughs> the OIE, or the World Organization for Animal Health, is an organization that is international and has developed guidelines for animal diseases. So these two graphics are just meant to be push the button. Thank you. Uh, are just meant to show you that there's a lot of planning and whether it's a local animal disease control uh, planning event or provincial, state, federal, or international, there is a lot of help. You don't have to do it. Somebody's already done it. 
really important to know that one needs to put goals and coordinate these kind of efforts. And you will know this, especially those of you When you're developing goals, there are a whole bunch of different factors. Most of the OIB guidelines refer to domestic animal diseases. So all of these are don't expect you to What's really super important is to go through these and look at which one you think about like disease. And many of them do, some of them not so much, but it's worth the exercise to do that. Just know that it's really complicated. And that's all these two slides are going to show you. Um, why do you have to control infectious animal diseases? Uh, disease control, please, Mike. Disease control is usually attempted for domestic animal disease when that disease affects humans. And it's usually when animal uh, diseases are considered a high risk for humans. And that just makes sense. This could work. This one. Kevin with the IT solution. Yeah. Uh, I didn't do it. No, Got it. it. No, it does work. Okay. So this really helps me out a lot. I want you to know that disease agencies those are listed here. Uh, some moves with insect vectors. So uh, diseases that are transmitted through ticks, or mosquitoes, etc. And some diseases are system environment. Just keep that in the back of your mind. And so these directions that diseases can move can be very, very complicated. And in many cases, we don't even know that. Um, okay. All right. Um, historically, fewer disease control attempts have been made in wild animals, just simply because um, we haven't had the resources we have to manage. And the economic costs are not considered as much. Basically, when those attempts are made, it's usually because of domestic Sorry, guys. Uh, disease control program goals. So I'm I really think I think part of it is agent as I mentioned. Then you need to go to the methods of conditions, and those can range everywhere from to eradication of the disease agent. Sounds like you can't have things the same. Check the chats. Sorry that was on Zoom. I didn't think of it. It's on Zoom. Yeah, that's what uh, Trish is indicating that maybe. All of this is being important. So I think there's nothing else. Hey, Trish, if you can hear me, can you hear Alan now? Give me a chat. Back. Not well. Yeah, but it's probably because we're closer to the owl. Um, oh. we moved. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
now. So there's an L tarp. Move that uh, a little bit. It's funny, I usually get accused of being awfully loud. <laughs> We can move it out. Just move it Are you sure you have a lot of Yeah, I just checked both speaker and microphone. Is this thing? So, testing, testing, testing. How's that now for Zoom people? Good. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Our apologies. All of that, both this year. Excellent. Thank you. Continue. All right, we're continuing. The next uh, bullet on the slide should say disease control strategies. And those consist of doing nothing and then preventing disease. And some of those ways to, are to perform disease risk assessments, control agent movement, and apply biosecurity. Most of you understand that. Controlling disease usually is through reducing prevalence or the disease severity, and that may be through treatments, vaccination or eradication of disease can be done through culling populations and testing culling individuals. Whoops. Oh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so controlling infectious diseases, how? Uh, disease control methods. And again, this is very, meant to be very general. Thank you. Uh, removing agent from the host, again, treat or increase immunity through vaccination. Uh, reduce exposure to the agent, change the local environment. And those of you involved with waterfowl projects, in the past we used to pick up dead birds affected with botulism or uh, uh, add cholera. Uh, we don't do that anymore, but there's other ways to change the environment through toxins, etc. Uh, that may, that not, might not be infectious disease transmission, but anthrax is another great example. Uh, reduce rates of transmission through reducing host density, reducing the number of animals, removing attractants, removing animals that focus on supplemental feeding, etc., and then moving animals. Removing an agent from a population is is what we're talking about here. And that's defined very loosely as assessing the infection status of an individual or herd and lethally or transporting animals away from that population that are confirmed infected by the specific agent. In domestic animals, it's usually culling. Um, in other places, it may be something a little bit different. In our case, we are calling it test and remove, but it's traditionally known as test and cull. Uh, the methods chosen depend on a variety of things. And I'm, I'm not gonna read those out because obviously we're running short of time and I don't want to. Um, uh, it's rarely one method alone. It's very unusual to have one single method. And consideration has to be given to continuing education, is there a public health risk? What's food safety and security like? Now that applies to some species far more than other species. Those of you in charge of, of animal health programs and agencies are well aware of HPAI, et cetera. Um, so I wanna talk about some of the diseases that are affected and are under control programs, uh, either historically or presently. And in domestic animals, there's a whole suite of them. 
in in uh, and the diseases again a whole suite of them and I and this is not an exhaustive list I just want you to get get an idea that yes we have control programs for rabies for HPAI for scrapie for B bovine tuberculosis and that fun one brucellosis and it includes historic diseases like rinderpest. Has it been successful in domestic animals? Well, sometimes, yeah. Render pest is a great example. It's considered eradicated globally. And if you don't know anything about it, there's some super interesting historic stuff about that disease, uh, primarily in Africa. Bovine TB is pretty much gone from the majority of cattle herds in North America, but it's not gone. It's certainly not gone globally. And we have uh, reservoir populations of wildlife in particular in, uh, in North America, never mind in Africa and other places. African swine fever, a big topic over the last couple of years, and foot and mouth disease, a continual topic as uh, in Africa. Uh, those diseases are present in er other uh, jurisdictions, other continents, and are always a threat. Long term, I think there's a lot of hope. Uh, we have new technologies being developed all the time. We understand the agents better, and we have some ability to use therapeutics for some diseases. Um, so there's some, but there is a huge threat because of global movement of people and animals and climate change and all kinds of other things. So nothing is for sure at this stage. What about wild animals? We have a huge list um, of disease threats, uh, and many of them affect multiple species. Uh, bovine TB is probably the classic example. Brucellosis is another one. Um, the list you can see, and I'm not just talking mammals, I'm talking amphibians, I'm talking birds, I'm talking little black-footed ferrets, which are mammals, I know that. Um, but there's a lot of different things that we've had to do some kind of animal control on. Um, has there been any success in wild animals? Well, I wasn't around in 1920, and I don't think anybody else was here, but there was a mass culling of deer in California for foot and mouth disease, and it did eradicate it. Um, those of you involved in the black-footed ferret program, there has been uh, massive vaccination programs. I think they've been fairly successful. I haven't seen any current evaluations of them, but it's hopeful. And there's been some really interesting uh, attempts to control rabies with uh, oral baits with uh, vaccines, and both in North America and Europe. And so hopefully those are, are showing some promise. But usually we're not seeing great success. And brucella, I hate to bring up brucellosis, but it's one, uh, bovine TB. We've had a population of elk in Canada that we think we've eradicated bovine TB from in Riding Mountain National Park in, in Manitoba, but that's why there's a question mark there because it's a sneaky disease. Um, HPAI, all these other ones that I've talked about, chronic wasting disease, another great example. Have we controlled it? No. Have we in Scandinavia? There was a big culling program there. I don't know if they've seen any more. It'll be really interesting to see what happens there. So this test and remove. Um, wild animal disease control is really limited. We can't treat them. We can't vaccinate them very often. Um, so we primarily focus on preventing introduction, controlling existing disease in any way we can, and eradicating the disease, which has, again, not been done that, that effectively in the past. Defining test and remove or test and cull again, assessing the infection status of the animal, legally removing the animal. I know some of the initial test and remove in the US captured affected animals that were identified and put them into captivity for further research. Is anybody doing that anymore? We're, we're killing everything now? I'm, I'm, I think we'll catch up on that. Um, we think, as far as principles are concerned with pest and remove or test and call, <clears throat> that the success is going to be improved where there's going to be low population size and density. And Francis is going to get into this a little bit more. But do we always know this? Or move? 
um, low connectivity between populations so that they're not reinfecting each other? Do, do we know that? And we don't always know that. Um, can we accurately identify the highest risk animals and remove them? And how many do we have to remove? Do, is it going to be enough? And does this agent persist in the environment or persist in St. Patrick's species? Do we always know that? Um, do we have a reliable test for infection? It's pretty good. About five minutes. Thank you. Um, drilling down to mycoplasma over pneumonia, is it reasonable to expect success from MOVTNR? I think it depends. It's quite different than these other diseases we've talked about. Uh, there does not appear to be a vector or an environmental contamination component with this disease transmissions primarily direct between animals. There is no effective treatment or vaccine. There is a primary host, and that's domestic animals. The risk will continue if you don't identify them, assess them, and do some kind of mitigation. The mitigation can range from education to treatment to testing call. We have testing methods. They're relatively sensitive and specific, and they can be done on live animals. That's a real advantage. Usually, it's a transient infection. Most animals do clear. And some are infected long-term, which is why we're doing this procedure. And we don't always know why. We've got trials. And I, Francis is going to go into this a little bit more, just briefly. Um, we know some really important epidemiological factors about Moby and bighorn sheep now. We have a community that's well-educated. You understand the concepts of biosecurity. You understand that we have to separate species, we have to quarantine animals, and we have some great tools in terms of standardized herd health assessments, uh, including translocations. So this is an incredible opportunity as a veterinarian, as a health professional. This is awesome, best thing ever happened in my career. So we have an opportunity, but it's not just for wild sheep, it's for wild animals in general. We have to get this out in the literature. Thank you, Francis. You've done a much better job than I have, that's for sure. Um, but there's going to be some long-term challenges. So what do we still need to do? We need to, we need to deal with this public and um, um, non-agency, I don't want to call it a threat, but concerns about needless killing and wasting. Uh, in British Columbia, we have not really had a lot of pushback, but that's because we, I think we've done a good job of educating people about this. So the consistent messaging is really critical. Um, we have great testing methods, but we need them better, and we're getting there. We've got some really great people on board now with, with dogs and academics, and we're, we're doing a great job there. Um, we still need to know more about the agent, the way it works with the hosts, and effective control options. There's going to be more coming up. I'm pretty convinced of that, and I think we're getting there as well. Um, there's been a tremendous expansion of these trials, and we're going to learn a lot from that because we have got some incredible commitments from NGOs, from agencies, from individuals to work this trial across populations. I think it's really, really exciting. And I, and I think that there's a continued willingness to commit and collaborate, and that's what today is all about. Um, we need to continue this education both at wild sheep levels and domestic sheep levels, uh, academic levels, uh, bureaucratic levels. You need to take this to your manager so they really understand it. We need to do adaptive management as issues identified. We've uh, almost eradicated some subpopulations. What do we do genetically? What do we do with those populations? How, do, how long do we leave those landscapes? vacant before we supplement those populations, et cetera. I think there's a lot, a lot more we need to learn there. We have to continue monitoring and assessing the results of test and remove. And I'm not sure we're there yet, but I think with an ongoing commitment, we will be. I, okay, I, thanks I, everybody I, and questions. Yeah, time for one. There you go. Thanks for working through the technology problems. That, that was Mike. Like, Thank you. How was the problem? Okay, one question. <laughs>
You're done. Thank you. Okay, Helen. Thank That's you. for you. All right. Next up, we'll have Francis Kazier talking to us about the, the test and remove guidelines that the Waffle Group has put together. Those have been published and are available, I think, on our website, aren't they, Mike? Um, I don't remember. Not. If not, we'll get them there. Well, thanks everybody, and many thanks to Helen for gracefully getting us through <laughs> technical difficulties. I hope. Can people hear me online? You had to ask. <laughs> yes. Folks are saying now they can't hear the audio when the presentation changed from Helen's to Francis. I think we dropped it to the camera mic. Let's see what you use. Can we try a different mic, maybe? Yeah, you want me to drop the owl? No, no, no. You want the owl. Yeah, they can hear us now. 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 It's, there's yeah there's a, there was a setting that changed because i'm watching it on the phone and the speaker disappeared between helen and friends of this lady and uh just share your screen yeah just share your yeah okay <laughs> Recite a uh, something. Brenda. Test and remove, test and remove. Yeah. I like it. No, well, after that with Mike, I think it needs to be a contrition. Okay, yeah, I've got good. Good. Uh, so, we're, can you back up um, for the virtual folks? Okay. Okay, we're just going to, I'm just going to talk about specifics about test and remove um, the basis, the scientific basis for test and remove, the execution of test and remove, and the follow-up, our recommendations. And as uh, Daryl mentioned, this is on, uh, is a wild sheep working group based on the, the guidelines uh, we put together for the wild sheep working group about a year and a half ago. They are on the Google Drive for the wild sheep working group. But they yeah, need to get on that. the Wild Sheep Initiative 
web page. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. So we'll do that. So that'll happen. Daryl. No taken. So uh, the uh, instances where uh, test room move is useful is to increase recruitment in populations that are experiencing low lab survival uh, due to pneumonia induced harm and mortality, especially associated with mycoplasma over pneumonia or MOE. It can also be used to reduce health risks of infected populations, big or cheap populations too. On nearby unexposed populations. It is not a management action that can be used to intervene in all age outbreaks. This disease has an acute phase of infection and a chronic phase of infection. And this uh, test and remove is um, intended to resolve the chronic phase of infection, not acute outbreaks. So, uh, this is just a conceptual model of a pneumonia that um, provides a basis for test to remove or pneumonia vicorchi. And so it starts with introduction of MOB from um, old world Cabernet, domestic sheep and goats to bighorn sheep, either directly or indirectly. And that usually results in an all age outbreak that um, can result in 50% mortality on average. And then the animals that survive that outbreak are most of them are perfectly healthy. They would when they recover, but some um, don't completely recover and they can become chronic carriers of MOV. And those chronic carriers they use uh, transmit MOV to lambs, and that results in pneumonia outbreaks in lambs, and so we get low recruitment. And so the idea of um, test remove is to get MOV out of the system and resolve the um, pneumonia, the disease in big sheep, particularly lambs. So our hypothesis is that individual sheep, usually females, but not exclusively, um, with long duration infections are responsible for maintaining MOV in the big sheep population. And these use initiate pneumonia outbreaks in lambs. And the um, basis for this is um, was initially uh, presented in the study from uh, the Lostine population in the Lao Mountains of Oregon, where uh, animals were repeatedly sampled, what we call longitudinal sampling, between 2013 and 2016. And so this um, plot shows the repeated sampling over the years. Uh, down here, 2,000 each Each of these. <laughs> Does anyone know how to get rid of that ribbon? Or no, but it's just leave it alone. <laughs> no. The red points are times with an animal. Each of these lines is an animal. It's numbers, numbered lines. And each uh, point is a, a test result from them. And so in this plot, in 33 adults that were sampled, see about this top group, which is about 30% of them, um, once they tested positive for MO, they tested positive for every, on every other occasion. Then there was a bigger group that occasionally tested positive and occasionally tested negative. Those are intermittent carriers. And then finally, there were some animals that are in the same population, all mixing together, and they never tested positive. And those are non carriers. And uh, also found that there's a high probability to test positive once of 75% choose that the next sampling will also result in a positive test, but there's a lot of variation. But uh, if test another animal sample again next year or two, um, and again test positive, then there's about a 90% chance that they're going to continue to test positive. So that's kind of uh, one of the pieces for our recommendations there. 
And this is um, some sheep at WSU in Captive. They were sheep from Rock Creek, Montana. Moved to Shreemar, who was the chair at the time. And they were, these are, are all from Rock Creek and Moved to Shreemar. They were all negative for Imogi until there was an experimental slash accidental um, exposure in the pens in 2015. And after that exposure, this sheet of 2.6 was positive every time, and nobody else did. So, uh, different kinds of carriers, plant carriers that are prioritized for removals. Human carriers that do not serve to food. And then, uh, didn't mention it, but in the Rothstein study, 80% of the labs that were tested were positive. So, not, not surprising, this is, this is mostly a disease of uh, lambs that most young animals will test positive. So, um, if you're going to test those, they're really not candidates for the role and should be tested. Some other important features of the disease that um, make it conducive to test and remove element through some of these. It is host specific, even though it has been um, found occasionally in caribou and white tailed deer. Main hosts are uh, sheep and goats. Um, also, big or sheep populations are often relatively small. Even when they're larger, there's a whole structure that can be um, exploited to uh, enhance our ability to test a large portion of the population, which is needed for to detect all the current carriers. Um, it doesn't persist in the environment, how we do that. And there is a reliable test for active infection. So both because there's not a long period where the animal's infected, but it's not detectable, say, for example, plant and waste disease, and because the PCR test is accurate. So our recommendations for implementation are to test all the um, adult use for your population at least once, and I have all in quotes because I think maybe Chad is 19 years or whatever it was in Custer State Park might be the only one that has actually tested every single or not yet, not all um, maybe somebody else will skip somebody, but you know, how to do test and possibly yeah. can. And then we test those that test positive in which the chronic carriers and the intermediate carriers. And then following removal and where you think you've cleared MOV from the population, we recommend that you test animals that were born after that um, to be sure that you test both on the PCR test and the antibody test. And they should be PCR and, and very importantly, antibody negative, which means they haven't been exposed. For testing, click nasal swabs for, for uh, PCR, sample both nostrils with, we recommend using swabs as synthetic material. And it's a good idea to collect a sec an extra swab, um, particularly in the case that you have an indeterminate result. Indeterminate means it's an inconclusive result. So that often when you send in the second sample, you'll, you can get a, a positive or a negative. And we recommend strain typing the um, MOB to determine how many strains are in the population and whether the strain of strains uh, is in different populations. And the number of strains in the population might affect um, how difficult it's going to be to clear MOB. And uh, knowing what, whether the same strains in different populations tells you something about transmission, either current or past of MOV between those populations. And then, of course, collect blood for antibody. So finally, our general recommendations 
is to plan for a multi-year project. Um, it seems like sometimes we'd like to just get things done really quickly, but I really don't know yet anybody that's been able to do it um, in more than several years. Probably, I would say three years minimum, but it depends. Um, the factors that might increase the amount of time and effort are there could be a new spillover during test and remove, which has happened in at least three times that I know of. And then you're going back to the acute phase of infection, so that will um, put things on hold for a bit. Um, and sort of related to that, having multiple MOV strains in the population could increase the difficulty of clearing MOV because you're kind of going, having periodic acute infections potentially. And then finally, co-infections or comorbidities, for example, as was discussed, I think, uh, I don't think you mentioned it actually, but sinus tumors is one thing that um, we that could possibly uh, complicate test and remove. And then finally, it is important to confirm clearance of MOV through follow-up testing because um, sometimes you get a good year of lamp survival even in the presence of MOV. So you, you need to test for it. And then finally, I um, just wanted to say that removal decisions are not always obvious and easy. Sometimes it's a no-brainer, and sometimes you spend quite a bit of time thinking about it and just be prepared for that. And that's all I have. Any questions? Any questions for Francis? Go ahead. Um, could you talk a little bit about why you didn't get the microphone? Thanks, Berlin. Could could you talk just briefly about why you did not mention Rams? I kind of mentioned them, but in passing um, <laughs> uh, because we've done several cases um, there have been several uh, test removes done with no rams removed um, I think rams I don't know why I have ideas but um, they're not as of course they're not usually going to be um, transmitting MOV to lambs for one thing they have a shorter lifespan so they're not likely to be chronic carriers for as long as used. Um, and there could be other factors associated with being a RAM that make you uh, less competent as a carrier. But um, yeah, I think that is um, a question. I think we're gonna talk about that a bit later, but um, I'm just presenting our initial guidelines and that's kind of a starting point. Not post testing rams though. It's not. No. Okay. Berlin, I think in the back. Did you have your hand up? Hi, thanks. Um, I was just wondering if the the chronic uh, testers shedders, if there you know of any research that shows whether like there's any differences in that some if they're chronically testing positive, that they have a high rate of transmission and that other animals, maybe they're still testing positive, but it's not necessary that they're transmitting the disease. Um, I I think there's a, a couple things in, uh, in, involved in that question, but in terms of just whether you're chronic, I think what the question was is, do you have a higher load of bacteria if you're chronic versus intermittent? Is that one of the questions? Yeah. Uh, if, if that then goes towards, uh, you know, maybe it, it's testing positive chronically, but it has a low load, so maybe it's not transmitting it. Or maybe it is a chronic carrier or a chronic shedder. Yeah. Oh, I see. Carrying versus shedding. Um, I kind of use them inter interchangeably, but um, I'm sure there are di there are differences in load. It's really hard to you can 
get a count or a, a kind of a index to the amount of DNA that's on the swab. But I think there's just more that goes into whether an animal transmits than just how much it sheds. This also has to be, it's a directly transmitted disease. So it has to be mingling with um, the other animals. So um, I guess, did you have an example of that or what brought up that question? No, I was just wondering if it's, I mean, it seems like basically if it's testing positive, it's removing it from the population is, is the guideline. But um, yeah, just wondering if, if anyone's done that research at all or if it's basically <laughs> nobody's done it yet, but that's just our assumption. Okay, I apologize, but we do need to move on. We're a little bit over time. So okay. let me order. just see if I can quickly clarify. Um, <laughs> so as Francis said, you can look at the PCR results and the, there is a figure that will tell you how much DNA they were picking up. So that will tell you a little bit, but an animal that is constantly testing positive is going to be at higher risk for shedding and transmission, period, just because the bacteria are there. Thank you, Anne. All right, thank you, Anne. We're gonna move into um, the next section, which is to hear from different jurisdictions about new test and remove programs and we've allowed 20 minutes for presentations and then 10 minutes for Q&A. So let's move on to that. Um, our next one is gonna be by Dan Walsh um, talking about the Highlands in Montana. Dan, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, <laughs> All right, Dan, so I'll um, try to chime in in some fashion when we've got about five minutes left for presentation, so. Welcome. Excellent. Can you see my presentation? Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks. So um, I'm Dan Walsh. I'm the unit leader for the Montana Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit. And um, if you're expecting Vanna Bakadori, um, you're you're unfortunately getting a third stringer here because both her and Kelly are out capturing sheep today um, for this project. So I'll do my best to to fill in and um, provide the information um, and answer any questions associated with the work that we're conducting. So the Montana um, project for test and remove is focused in unit 340, we call it um, the Highland Sheep Project or Highland Sheep Herd. And it's down in southwestern, southwest, southwestern corner of Montana, um, near Melrose, kind of south of Butte, north of Dillon. And in the landscape or, or the land use patterns, um, there's a fair amount of both Forest Service, BLM, and, and some state um, public lands intermixed with a reasonable amount of private lands and the sheep use both private and public um, lands throughout throughout their range. The characteristics um, are pretty varied actually across the subherds. We have sheep in, in relatively high elevation, um, at least for Montana um, regions, as well as some of these sagebrush steppes, sagebrush hills, some kind of rugged canyon lands, as well as um, these uh, irrigated alfalfa fields, which this, um, some subherds use really heavily uh, during the summer months. Uh, I was asked to kind of provide a history of this herd um, to provide a context for why we decided to apply test and remove. And so as the story is for many of the herds across the West, um, it was extirpated during the early 1900s. But in the mid 1960s, 1967, 22 sheep were reintroduced in the Highland Range. And then that was supplemented two years later with 31 sheep. And from there, things went really well. Um, the her herd and population took off and we had three to 400 sheep by the mid 1900s. And at that time, the state was giving out 35 U permits as well as 35 other sex permits um, up until about 1994. And that's when the kind of bottom dropped up dropped out and it's kind of the story we hear across the west we had an all-age die-off in the herd 90 percent mortality and when it was all said and done there was probably less than 100 bighorn sheep across the range for the next few years it was kind of left under a kind of a nat natural regulation management strategy but then in about 2000 and for the next decade or so um, there was a series of augmentations from different herds within montana that were that were doing well the sun river herd the bonner herd the ruby mountains missouri breaks etc um, and during that time period, in conjunction with these augmentation efforts, um, a number of these animals received VHF collars. And 
we had um, students from, from, from Butte tracking them in the, in the 2000, 2008. And then we had a dedicated FP, uh, FWP, uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks Technician for about three years. Had a little hiatus for a couple of years. And then um, the Wild Sheep Foundation, Skyline Sportsman funded a couple of years of, of a technician to, to track and monitor survival of these animals. And the results from this initial work was that we, we determined there is five subherbs um, shown here the um, La Marche, the furthest west, west of I-15, the Sheep Mountain, and then the Foothills, the Red Mountain, and in the, in the southeast, the Notch Bottom Herd. And at, at, at this time, based on the VHF, we didn't think there was a lot of uh, mixing uh, between these, these uh, various um, home ranges or, or subherd uh, locations, except for potentially rams. And as kind of is a common story for these kind of test and remove herds, production is good, but lamb survival is pretty variable. Um, and there was evidence of persistent pneumonia. And the uh, Knox bottom herd down here in the southeast, you can see these little, um, you can see my pointer, but there's a little uh, domestic sheep um, icons. So, so that herd was believed to be commingling with, um, or potentially commingling with domestic sheep as well. Other findings from this initial um, VHF tracking, um, there was only one migratory herd, um, and that was the Red Mountain herd, and that's actually the legacy herd or, or the remnant herd from the original um, sheep that experienced the die-off. The rest, the other four subherds shown here are actually um, herds that uh, were established via transplant. They're all non-migratory. And we definitely had, in, in, this, in the subpopulations that we, we uh, sampled, there's definitely evidence of exposure to, to, to MLV, um, with the exception of the LaMarche herd. Um, and we saw shedding, or they saw shedding in, in the samples in, in the foothills. These herds are not exceptionally large, ranging, or these subherds are not exceptionally large, ranging from 15 to 30 animals, and land survival is kind of variable across, across these groups. So that kind of brings, a, that's kind of the historical perspective, um, and it, this herd um, because of its structure, its size, and, and, and the knowledge that MLV was present and potentially limiting the population, was chosen to do a management experiment um, that we described here, and, and that's centered around test to remove. So our kind of our goal, our desired response is to eliminate MLV from this population, um, increase lamb survival, and ultimately um, have population growth that we can, so that we can attain the numbers that we saw in the mid-1900s, hopefully in the future. So we've set up a kind of a before or after control design um, where uh, our treatments are going to be, um, two of these subherds will be doing tests to remove in, one subherd remains as a control, and then uh, two subherds um, re will receive selenium supplementation. Um, so that's, that's a little bit outside of discussion today, but um, that's kind of the structure that we've set up currently. And so for the first couple of years, and we're just entering year two of, of our study, um, we're monitoring disease exposure of individuals, um, capturing as many animals we can get our hands on, monitoring land survival and cause specific mortality and looking at the connectivity of the subherds. And this last point is important because um, with the information that we're gaining from that, we may restructure our, our, our treatments based on um, the connectivity patterns we, we see. Um, it's looking like maybe these things aren't as independent as we'd hoped. In years three and four, then we're gonna apply a treatment and that's gonna be removing um, the animals that we identify as chronically sh shedding um, based on PCR results. And then the next um, couple of years, we'll be monitoring um, particularly lamb survival, but also uh, uh, serology um, and, and shedding for, for MLV. The methods that we're employing, um, I was kind of asked to talk about how, how we're capturing these animals. We're, we're using hil winter helicopter net, uh, net gunning. Um, we're going to be sampling and collaring, as I mentioned, all ewes, yearlings, and juvenile rams that we can get our hands on um, based on kind of the recommendations that Francis was talking about. Um, we'll, we'll, um, insert vaginal implant transmitters in each of the ewes to facilitate neonatal capture. And then we'll be putting either VHF or not potentially GPS expandable collars on neonates in the spring. And we'll be, we'll be doing hand capture for the neonates. With the animals that we're capturing, we're gonna be doing a kind of typical um, testing for pathogen exposure, serology screening. Because of that selenium piece, we'll be also doing some trace mineral analysis um, and looking at pregnancy and body condition. So some results um, from the first year. Um, so our ca we captured for the first time last year about this time. And so we have some, some information from the first um, suite of captures. So in 2022, we captured and tested 54 sheep that included 34 ewes, 13 rams, and seven six-month-old lambs. 
Um, of those, 31 use and one yearly RAM received collars uh, and, and VITs. Uh, the use received the VITs. Um, the mortalities that we saw over the, the, the resulting uh, time period from, from then till now, we've seen six U's that, that have uh, died. One from lion predation, one from a vehicle, one from pericarditis, um, one was cats related, and two were kind of pending. Uh, the cause of death is pending, waiting on some of the disease um, results from the lab. Um, for as far as the movement information that we collected, um, we are seeing some subherd sub -herd interchange that we didn't see with the VHF collars. Um, we have there's a real yearling ram moving from Sheep Mountain, which is the um, subherd there in yellow. He's crossed I-15 and went into um, Foothills, which is the purple, as well as um, interacted with the marsh herd, which is in blue. And then more recently, we've had ewes from the Sheep Mountain, the yellow um, subherd, move over to the to the marsh, the blue subherd, cross the Big Hole River. Um, though we haven't necessarily documented uh, intermixing of the two subherds, they're definitely um, using the same range. Uh, the disease status results from our initial sampling um, are shown here, and, I, and I'm focusing on MLV. Um, we have anywhere from 40 to 13% um, prevalence with various sample sizes from the different um, uh, sub subherds. The top portion are all ages, including the lambs, and the bottom portion of this table are just the adults only. Um, and then on, on the right-hand side is the exposure um, that we're, we're seeing with the, um, the ELISA tests. And we can see that most of the herds have, have a, uh, an animal sample have been exposed to MLV. Some of the other pathogens that, that, there, that we've tested for but aren't necessarily focusing on at this time is virus tiny trialosi, Mannheimia hemolytica, hemolytica um, Truparella pyogenes, Mannheimia ruminalis, Fostrella multocida. We've also been looking for evidence of leukotoxin gene, um, Mannheimia cavii, and Mannheimia glucosida. Um, and you can see the prevalences range anywhere from 55% uh, to zero um, across these different, these other. Um, respiratory uh, pathogens. The second objective of our project is obviously, we, we said our metric is going to be lamb survival. And so we need to get the pre-treatment information collected um, so we can see what kind of what baseline is. And so we've initiated collection um, this year. We captured 24 neonates from our collared ewes um, and a few opportunistically. Um, that involved 15 females, nine, or 15 females, nine males. And various causes of death associated with those collared animal, collared lambs include lion predation, some natural causes, uh, cats related, two that were unknown, we couldn't get to the carcass quick enough. And then um, I do want to note that one uncollared un lamb was found that in the foothills, which is the, the purple um, subherd, um, was uh, documented of dying of pneumonia. And at this time, as, as you all know, these collars fall off. And so there's five individuals that were right censored. It's also important to note that we have observed clinical signs um, in, in, the, in these subherds, particularly the notch bottom foothills and sheep mountain herds. Our last objective, which is a little outside of this, um, of this workshop, but uh, I figured it would be worth reporting on because it's part of the study, was looking at um, selenium, selenium and trace mineral levels um, for the different, uh, different subherds. I'm not going to focus too much on here, just to, but just to say that we didn't really see any differences between subherds as far as uh, mineral, the various mineral levels. And all the animals, excepting a ewe and a lamb from Sheep Mountain, had low or critically low levels of selenium based on domestic sheep reference levels. So you know, take that with a grain of salt. And kind of con concluding then, um, our future dire directions, um, the testing will happen uh, for five, six years of the study, um, and our removal will happen starting next year. Um, 2024 and in 2025. So we're, we're really just in the initial phases of this, kind of getting the baseline information, allowing us to hopefully identify um, the individuals that are, that are driving uh, the uh, episodic and lamb, lamb mortality in the herds. Um, I was asked to talk about takeaways. I'm not sure I have any yet. Um, other than this is obviously this is, this is challenging work. It's going to take a lot of time and effort, um, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. So um, with that, I think that's the update from, from our, our herd here in Montana that's uh, doing the test and remove. Wow, Dan, thank you. Good presentation, very efficient. <laughs> we have quite a bit of time for questions, about uh, 20 minutes. So <laughs> let's see any questions for Dan. Let's do those first and then maybe we can go back and if you've got questions for Francis or Helen, we can go backtrack just a little. Uh, okay. This is for Dan, I guess. What efforts are you making to 
address your domestic sheep disease um, pathogen issue? That's a good question, and I, I, mean, I can't actually speak to that. That's, I can uh, get your contact information and talk talk to Vanna, who's the manager down there. Um, I'm not sure exactly if those domestic sheep um, herds are still present. Um, I don't, I don't know exactly. These things kind of fluctuate, and I don't, I don't know the size of the operations either. Um, so it's a good question, and obviously, you know, test and remove. I guess my opinion is if there's con a continual introduction from domestic sheep. Um, it's probably not going to be likely to be successful unless it's sustained for a long period of time. So um, good question, but I, I don't know the answer to it. Um, in reference to one of the questions that Frances um, had uh, to her, we, when we um, remove animals in British Columbia, we do necropsies on the site. And I've seen a really interesting pattern um, of pneumonia, chronic tracheitis, chronic bronchitis, sometimes not much there at all. And I think that's got to add to um, what you actually see on the test results in terms of whether it's a chronic carrier or an intermittent carrier, because the mycoplasma that's down deep in the lung probably doesn't come up very often, or maybe it does. But I think, I think that probably explains a little bit because they're all not exactly the same at all. Will the owl? Yeah, I don't know, but I'll hand this to you. I think this is for um, maybe for Francis, but also Dan, because he mentioned this as well. One of the things I was hoping to get today was recommendations for a proportion of actions following a high. Or let me start over. What are the recommendations? for a higher proportion of the, a smaller population testing positive. So let's say you have 40 sheep and in your initial sampling, they're half positive or something like that. So I think we'll tease that out today, but I just wanted to throw that out early. Francis, the mic is behind you. If you want to tell you the family, they have a So am I answering? Um, so I guess, I think that's where the serial testing really starts to become important. Uh, I guess my, my thoughts on this, to try to uh, separate out those intermittent versus chronics. If obviously removing that that proportion of the population isn't feasible. And, and that's something that we're actually we're discussing here in Montana. We're, we're waiting to see as the disease results come in across, across years, what is that proportion and, and how many of those individuals are, are serially testing positive? Because initially you might get a, a pretty decent prevalence rate, but I think that the serial testing and the kind of that graph that uh, uh, um, Francis show shows the, the efficacy of, of multiple testing to reduce the number of individuals you potentially would have to remove. But Francis probably has uh, uh, some good thoughts on this. I think that's a, a good answer. And I also think um, that is an unusual situation. So um, it's one of the people who doesn't come up very often. Oh yeah, um, timeline. You gotta know when was that section. Like if you Mike was saying that they might be in their acute phase if you got half of them. And also if if they have um, several strains because immunity is strain specific. So even if they had one they had MOB for a long time, but they are getting yeah, or you might just be hitting it at the wrong. You need to, I think, be testing, you're doing string typing, both of the things. There was a question virtually from Dr. Caitlin. Yeah. Um, and it's a common question, Francis. Uh, is it one strike, two strike, three strike? When do you make that decision? Talk about it a lot. You can give folks a bit more background. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
I think that's good, uh, a very good question because I think even Mike and I have discussed this and um, it's really context dependent. Um, I think we have a very good basis for doing uh, testing, retesting for several reasons. One, I showed you that most animals that test positive will not be positive on the next test. And I've got some, some examples from Hills Canyon on that. And secondly, as I mentioned, you're rarely going to be done in one year anyway. So you're going to have to be going back in the population. And so it's not, so, so logistically, it's, um, it shouldn't be a big um, deal. But like I said, it's context dependent. If you have one shot to go in there and you've got every sheep and, uh, you know, I mean, I guess it's just, you have to make some decisions on your own. But I think um, that two, at least two tests is, is well supported. And you can test more, um, you know, for example, a yearling, a young animal tested positive and then it tested positive again, you might want to give it another year. If you have a small population of native sheep and you want to be really careful about who you remove. So different contexts. Curry had a question. I have a question for Dan, uh, two of them. Did any of the um, ewes that died, were any of them by any chance positive animals for MLB? I don't, re I don't think so. Okay, so you can't, it's not like you can have a natural experiment if one of the uh, ewes that had been tested died and was one of the positive ones, you might see a change in the population just from the loss of that animal. No, yeah, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't. I don't think that's going to be the case um, for for the ones that that have have died. Um, some of those disease results are still pending, so I can't say um, for for every individual. But the ones that I've seen have not um, tested positive. Okay. Then my other question was: Did you test for any um, respiratory viruses? No. So we focused mainly uh, on the bacterial species. So we didn't do um, any any of the viral species, no. Hey Dan, I, I might have missed this, but did what is your goal to test all the what what is the goal? To test all the sheep or all the ewes in each of those subpopulations? Yeah, so obviously we'll, we'll see how good uh, Quicksilver is, but yeah, we're we're trying to um, test every ewe that's priority, then then the uh, six month old, and then the, and then the rams um, thereafter. So yeah, our, our goal is to try and get as, as many tests per individual with all the individuals we can. So um, trying to, to get a full assessment across the population and across individuals. Whether or not that's going to be achievable is yet to be seen. That red mountain herd, for example, we didn't have any collars in there, if you noticed, and they didn't have collars in there previously. Um, and so that's that's going to be the focus, hopefully tomorrow, um, when they're capturing to try and get get information from that herd. But we'll see how successful we are. Um, I've lost sound. Very lost sound. Okay, now I hear it, hear it again. Okay. <laughs> it must be a delay when you kick in and out of the screen sharing. Uh, okay. All right. Nothing else for Dan. We'll move on then. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Yeah, I think next up is Nate and Scott. I'm talking about the snowstorms, the Santa Rosa's rattlesnake ten mile in Oregon and Nevada. Thanks, gentlemen. Let's see if this is going to list. This is still working, right? Thank you. Yes. And it, all right. Well, I'm Nate Hugh. I'm the veterinarian for Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, and this is a project that we started a couple of years ago. Um, and we it's been a 
uh, interstate collaboration with ODFW. So we just want to give you guys a little bit of background on kind of the collaboration and some things that we're doing a little differently. Um, so just go to the background. Um, this is the map of the um, Santa Rosas. You can see the border um, and our different subherds. So the Eight Mile, Capitol Peaks, uh, Martin Creek, Sawtooth, and Endorno Peterman are ours. And then 10 Mile Rail Snake are the ODFW. Um, down to the south um, west, we have a, uh, another range called Bloody Run Mountains, and they are um, currently negative. And then to the southeast, um, from coming out kind of from Capitol Peak along that river corridor is another range called the Snowstorm Range, where we have conducted a test and remove since 2016. Um, and I'll talk about why that's important in a minute. Here's the button. Okay, so for our 10 mile rattlesnake herds, they are a reintroduction. Um, both herds were reestablished in the uh, early 90s, um, you know, with, with, uh, with sheep from within Oregon and more specifically in source stock from Hardin Mountain. Scott, go closer. All right, gotcha. And uh, currently our 10 mile population is down to about 17 sheep. They've kind of struggled really hard with this MOV and then also the removal efforts. Um, and then the rattlesnake population, like I said, same story established in the uh, early 90s. And they peaked about 134, and that's just a minimum count. So it's a pretty, pretty good group of individuals. And now we're down to about 65. And we consider both these populations decreasing to, um, you know, stable to decreasing. Oh, oh. <laughs> don't hit that little button. <laughs> So in Santa, uh, the Santa Rosa range uh, consists of five subherds, um, Andorno, Peterman, the Sawtooth, Eight Mile, Capitol Peak, or Calicos, and Martin Creek. Um, the first release in Santa Rosa was in 1978 with sheep from British Columbia, um, with several subsequent releases at various sites. Um, the, it reached a population of 350 animals. Um, at its height, and there's currently about 100 left among all those five subherds um, post uh, multiple spillovers. Um, it's also connected, as we discussed, with Bloody Run Mountains. Um, it also has, because it had um, multiple introductions, it has or initially had pretty good genetic diversity for reintroduced, or not reintroduced, for introduced California bighorn sheep in Nevada. Um, populations, there's one that's potentially stable, but most are decreasing. So in Nevada, the initial MOV spillover occurred in 2003 from the domestic sheep in the sawtooth subherd. Um, there was a subsequent LH die-off with PCR positives identified in 2007, um, and that is what we have now deemed the Santa Rosa strain. Um, and that strain has been present in all our five subherds. Okay, so for Oregon, the spillover timing was not really clear. I did actually kind of look at my data pretty thoroughly the other day in preparation for this. We did see some reduced rail land recruitment in that eight nine time period, and and we've um, and I'm still struggling with um, trying to figure out if there was any type of die off. If there was, as we go from the adult standpoint, um, you know, so it's it is what it is there, but. Um, Forward at my color goes. Um, and so, like we mentioned earlier, we've been working Oregon and Nevada together for, I think, 14 years ago. We had a meeting to start kind of collaborating on this project. And so we, we collared um, individuals in Oregon in 2012, and half of them were ELISA positive. So we know that was a time frame of, of at least having known ELISA exposure. Um, and then we confirmed that strain type in the, from the Santa Rosas in the rattlesnake herd with a, a ram mortality in 2015. So that was a puzzle piece that, that connected um, us to the Nevada outbreak as far as strain type goes. Um, and then some of the subsequent MOV spillover. Um, 
In the winter of 2021, um, we were conducting a capture in Buddy Run Mountains and also conducted capture in Andorno Peterman. We had a ram mortality that was due to significant pneumonia. That animal was strain typed um, and came back as the snowstorm strain. Um, and so this was really the impetus for um, beginning the test and remove operation because we had been uh, conducting a test and remove in the snowstorm range um, since 2016. We thought we had it cleared. Um, it ended up, we did, and we'll talk about that later, we talked about earlier, have probably a ram reservoir that allowed for some reinfection of ewes uh, in the snowstorm range. Um, and so that's been kind of a longer ongoing project than initially expected. We currently have good lamb recruitment there, um, but we're not 100% sure if that's totally clear. But this ram came up probably the Humboldt River. Um, you know, we don't know the exact trajectory, um, but this was the first sign that, um, you know, we had, we had the strain um, now in the Santa Rosa range. Um, there also had been some ram movement uh, between the Bloody Run Mountains and the Snowstorm Range. Luckily, those animals went back and didn't interact with the main herd in the Bloody Run, and those are still negative as far as we know. Um, so we just got really lucky with timing that it didn't spread further. Um, and then we did also identify the Snowstorm Strain in Capital Peak in 2022, so it may have come there initially before moving down to Andorno Peterman, um, but we're not, we just don't, you know, know. Okay, moving north. Man, I'm jinxed. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, and, and today uh, the, the snowstorm strain hasn't been identified in Oregon, so cross our fingers we're not having to deal with additional um, spillover from from it will be again. So badass turn. So just real brief, we're going to talk about additional pathogen testing. Um, we had exposure to blue tongue, HD, BBD, um, haven't had any significant issues with that, PA3. Um, we have low levels of lungworm present and low levels of enteric parasitism. Um, we do have leukotoxin positive pastoral, pastoralaceae in the herd. Um, and we also have identified um, sinus tumor in the herd. Yeah, and for Oregon, it's the same story. Um, you know, we, we sample the same diseases and, and similar results. Um, but one thing we've had a little bit more struggle with is blue tongue. We've had a cup, you know, one confirmed um, event about four years ago where we lost a, a number of rams and few ewes during the right. September, October time period. And that had happened prior, just wasn't able to put the pieces together. So blue tongue is another. Um, disease that we're struggling to deal with a little bit, but it's not necessarily a huge outbreak. We're just dealing with five to six to 10 animals, um, which is is a, is a big number when you deal with these small populations, but it's it's out there. So but, um, project plan. So the goals were eliminate MOV from the entire range. Um, with this specifically, we it was also to prevent spillover of any strain to the Bloody Run Mountains, prevent strains moving back to the snowstorm range, and then hopefully also prevent the snowstorm range, the snowstorm strain from moving up into Oregon. Um, and then hopefully with a long-term goal of recovering the herd to pre-spillover levels. So the metrics for success are lamb recruitment, um, negative PCR, and then native laminalizes when we do reach that point, which we're not there yet. Um, the testing objectives, you know, our goal is to sample more than 80% of each subherd. Um, ideally, we'd sample all animals, but that can be challenging. Um, we're, that means around 80 to 90 individuals in each state. Oregon's 
uh, plan is, and if you want to say anything about that, um, 40 a year for two years. Ours is about 20 to 40 a year for a minimum of three years. Um, we're going to sample both adult use and rams because of the situation that we ran into this into the snowstorms where we believe that that there was a ram reservoir that prevented us from eliminating it and we thought we're going to include um rams in this and this goes the difference with that is it goes into a lot of the factors um that are different about nevada and southern oregon than a lot than other areas in terms of water and animal movement that mike's going to talk about later today um so testing strategy, we are going to do a single test and the individual is removed, um, which is, as Francis mentioned, not um, more, you know, obviously it's different than the guidelines. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, that um, one is just cost and time. So, you know, we're talking about 100 animals. So that's significant time and capture effort when we're talking, you know, in this low density, a couple thousand dollars in animal capture, you're putting collar on. And so for us, you know, it just turned into time and staff time and money to having to recapture. We also wanted to act quicker in order to prevent further movement of this strain and further spillover. Um, so that's you know, there. So, and then with animals with an indeterminate PCR will result. The one exception to that single test is yearling animals. So we had, did have some positive yearling animals that we did not remove. Um, but the older age class animals, when we have a single test, it's, we're removing those. Um, and then we'll well test lambs um, once they are believed to be MOV free. Um, and we are going to test lambs here next month in the snowstorm range to give us an idea of whether that's a continued source or the kind of dynamics between the two to the two herds right now. Capture me method is all helicopter net gun. Um, with us, we've been doing two captures a year, so winter, February, and then an August capture. So current status. Yeah, so for Oregon, like I said, we got about 95 sheep in those combined herds. It's a little less now, but um, we've got, you know, 40 of them sampled last year. We're moving forward next week, so Tuesday. Um, and then we did have four positive individuals on our first round um, on that first capture, and they were subsequently removed. And just from a, I can't remember if we have another slide or not, but it was uh, one, one old, old ewe that we captured in 2012. And then um, two rams, I think a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and then we had a yearling ram that was also positive, but we removed him as well. So for Nevada, um, again, herd size of 100, um, we tested 77, we've removed eight. We've actually removed 10, unfortunately, with our experimentation with biomine, we removed two false positive animals. Um, and that's been through three. Um, and then um, three different captures. And then for lamb recruitment in Nevada, these numbers look better than they are because we just don't have very many animals. So the ewe population is pretty low. So we only have seven, eight ewes in a population and it's not moving the needle much to have four lambs. Um, and then the, the other thing I've noticed, Sawtooth, this is this year, we are hopeful that Antonio Peterman and Sawtooth are free at the moment. Um, eight Mile, we did have lamb mortality uh, that was found by um, one of the technicians that we sort of know that is still present there. Um, and then Martin Creek has very few animals and no, no lamb. Yeah, and like Nate said, you got to kind of take our numbers with a grain of salt. So for our 10 mile, it was, there's two lambs, you know, so yeah, it's 25%, but it's only two lambs, so it's a small population. Like, we're not moving the needle. Rattlesnake, um, I uh, did get out there in, in, in July, and man, I was not convinced those sheep, those lambs were healthy. And I just haven't had uh, the chance to, to get back out there. We're going to be out there here next week, when we're a little better, but... You know, we're still still learning and still working on it. 
And so, yeah, like I mentioned, last January is our first round of capture. 40 individuals captured this year. Starting Tuesday, we're going to shoot for another 40 and just evaluate and go from there. So, and of course, we'll be continuing with summer um, land monitoring. And fortunately for us, we're, our office has been understaffed and now we're back to full staff. So I'll have more warm bodies to put on the landscape and count sheet this summer. So better results. So for Nevada, um, August 2021, 31 sample or removed. Um, 2022, uh, 19, one positive removed. And then August of last year, we did sample 19 animals. Unfortunately, we didn't identify any positives. So that was a bit disappointing, especially knowing the status of some of those subherds. Um, so it may, it may just be that there's that one animal left as the needle in the haystack. Um, so we're going to conduct additional captures this year. Um, we'll focus on eight mile capital peak at Martin Creek, um, because we know those are the areas that are having more issues and especially capital peak is where we we've caught probably the least percentage of animals. And then in Martin Creek and eight mile, it's possible just the, the number of animals that there's only one positive. And then land production will be continued to monitor, be monitored as well. You want me to yeah, that? yeah, okay. Well, say, so monitoring summer lamb surveys, sample lambs from Moby. Um, and just going through some of our takeaways. So consider the time it takes to conduct. Um, what we found with the snowstorms is you can think you're free multiple times. Um, there's setbacks, there's animals that you miss, there's you know, a lot of things that can happen that can make it take a lot longer and require a lot more time, effort, and money. Um, and then, so consider the risk when you're talking about this to other herds. So, you know, the question is, should we have depopulated the snowstorm range? We found out when we did started the testing group there and sent animals to South Dakota that this was a really pathogenic strain of MOV. Um, and so there's no right or wrong answer. It would have been wildly unpopular. But it is something to consider, depopulation is something to consider when you have a potentially smaller a spillover in a smaller herd that is a potentially bigger risk if it spills over into a larger herd. So, or perhaps a reintroduced population that may spill over into, you know, a native population that's, you know, maybe a higher priority. So those are some things to consider. Um, there's a yeah a large time invention an investment in monitoring removal. Um, I don't know if you want to you put that in there. So that you have that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's just you know it's an honest cross the board with, with the people that are doing this. It takes a lot more time and effort and than than a lot of people think. So, um, and another point in things you know I've seen anecdotally doing these captures with working with Nevada and us is is just the uh, the evasion capabilities of these use. Um, we've been working these sheep herds. So prior we had a grad student rub span. And so we did three years of captures and then we did some previous captures. And so the, the evasion rates of helicopters by these old uses is, is uh, pretty impressive. Um, so, and, the, and a, another thing to consider, and I guess I'm throwing this out to, as a question to the group is in these small populations, like what we have left in the 10 mile, and if you're unable to catch that last one or two ewes, how much effort do we put in to um, getting her captured or do we just remove her? You know, so I'm throwing that out. Do we do some bull biology? So, and I can talk about that a little bit. The other, you know, so the last thing is having a good animal size side test um, when we talk about time and effort would it would be beneficial. Um, so especially when you're talking about, you know, testing an animal, releasing it, waiting for a positive and having to go back in, that's a lot of time for a biologist to be hiking around or bringing back in a capture company. It's a significant expense. I think one year we had two animals because they, we weren't capturing in that mountain range. Our costs were something like $15,000 just to remove those two animals. So, because I was the only, we had to have them ferry all the way over there. And then they had to find two specific animals in a large mountain range. So, you know, that's something that would really have, we're not there yet. We tried the biomeme 
Um, unfortunately, um, we did remove two um, uh, false positive animals. And that goes into kind of some of the clinical judgment as well. Um, when you're looking at these animals, I think because of, you know, and this is a small, obviously, sample size, but during that whatever week that we were, a few days that we were capturing and using the bio meme, the animals that we removed that were um, truly positive had some clinical signs. They had lung, uh, lung auscultation changes. Um, and then they had necropsy findings that were consistent, whereas, you know, we didn't hear anything abnormal. The, the animals uh, looked healthier than we, that were the false positives, and then we you know necropsy. And now, you know, as Helen mentioned, there could be animals that look totally normal that are positive, but I think, you know, that it, you, you can use clinical judgment some on some of these long-term chronic shedders. We had um, an animal in NTTR that we, because it's difficult to go back on and remove animals, that we remove based on clinical science alone. Interesting, she was uh, nasal swab negative, um, but Karina swab positive. So I think using that clinical judgment in, in, with the animal size test can help prevent maybe some of those false accidental false positives or help you make uh, more sure about um, what animals you're removing. Um, that being said, like, you may have those animals look very normal and you have to go back in and find them if they're truly positive. Um, possibility of three or more years of sampling, it, you know, what we found with that is, and with the snowstorms and now going to this, is it, you, you have to commit to being in, in it for the long run, I think. You have, can't just be optimistic and say it's only going to happen for a few years because, things never go as planned. Um, you know, you might, for those of us even that are using contract crews that we only have, you might have a couple weather days and then you're on to the next year. Um, you need strong partners. This is expensive. Um, you might need NGOs to provide additional funding. They can provide, um, you know, more volunteers, um, count lambs or what, you know, and having the buy-in to these groups that have supported us a lot for various other projects is important as well. Um, and then also buy-in of stakeholders and sportsmen is important. And then that's all we have. Yes, Beach. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Nate, just to follow up with um, your kind of one of your last takeaways about having a better animal side, you know, testing protocol or method. Do y'all plan to continue to use the biomeme for these next few years? And also, um, have you had any pushback internally or with any public that you're having to deal with um, kind of with this like one strike and you're out approach? Um, we're not planning on using the bio meme. We were borrowing a bio meme, um, actually from Dan Walsh's PhD student. So we didn't end up, we were going to buy one. And then based on those results, we decided to step back and see what other options come out there. Um, but I think Oregon has different. So as far as the, the bio meme goes, Oregon did purchase one here a number of years ago. And, and um, our veterinarian, Julia, Julia Burko, has got a uh, extern student that's kind of dabbling in testing it and comparing it to results that have been samples sent to Waddle. So it's kind of a work in progress. So we'll, we double sampled our, our sheep last year with two, two swabs, one for the um, biome and one for Waddle, and then we're going to be doing that again this year. It's work in progress. And as far as um, your second question was, um, push pushback? Nope, we're in good shape. <laughs> And I'll just say, we did try after that initial one, you use the bio meme to provide them some more data um, for a couple of years. And we still continue to have issues where it's difficult to interpret. I think there's some issues um, in respect to the DNA extraction method, um, maybe especially in terms of a place like Nevada, where a lot of their- Just uh, watching a, the sheep, wild sheep meeting. Just not yeah, it's just a
Um, so I was just gonna, yeah, I was just gonna say that um, with the extraction method, I think a lot of their uh, the initial work was done for the negative um, controls, which is blank swabs. Um, and you can imagine in Nevada, we have a lot of dust and there's a lot of debris on those nasal swabs for all animals. And so I think there's some more work that needs to be done there. So we did provide that. And then I haven't had any pushback, but I don't know if Mike or Ed, um, Ed shaking his head. Mike shaking his head. So. Good support. Yeah, good. Any other questions? I just had a quick question. On those 77 in Nevada and in the Oregon, are those all new captures, or are you going back into some of the collared animals and, re and looking at them again? Are those all brand new animals in both states? So they are brand new in terms of the test and remove project. Some of the animals were previously captured quite a while ago or may have non-working collars so they were tested at some point um but it's been quite a few years um since then so these are all all 77 are new for the most part there might be a couple but for the most part they're all new for the project some of them were previous captures from like rob spawn's project or something like that Good questions. Any more? We'll let them off easy. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule, and we had intended that if you needed to get up and go use the facilities or whatever, go ahead. But why don't we take five minutes, Get up and stretch a little bit if you'd like, or quick go to the restroom, but um, we'll get started again on my watch in five minutes at 10 15. And there, did everybody have a chance to sign this so that we know who all showed up today? If not, Melanie's got it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just right there. Yeah. 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 The video part of that's going to archive anywhere. Yeah, it's being recorded and it's being filmed, and we can we can we can either send the link to the recording and see everybody that shows up, which is probably do, and then I'll probably try to put it on while time. Yeah, I'm doing a Just telling you, I need to let Zoom use my. Oh, great. I'm going to, it might kick me off and I'll jump right back on here. That's okay, Scott. We've got time. Okay. Because it's giving me some security thing about screen recording. Oh, it just has to agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is, and it's going to kick me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and he's been texting me about technology. <laughs> well, in worst case scenario, I can, I, I can run it. Advanced the supply. Yeah. <laughs> that was our backup. It's dark up there in Alaska. Oh, 
Okay. I'm back. Sorry about that. Well, that looks much better. Okay, I got a Zoom update at the same time. That's nice. Okay. Here we go. There we are. Does that look better? Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks and uh apologize for the technical difficulties and sorry I'm doing this remotely. Um I'm going to talk about our test and remove project um, in Oregon, the Burt River and Lookout Mountain. Um, as, as Kevin said, I'm Scott Peckham. I was formerly the, the big game ecologist for the Umatilla tribes from 2015 to 2022 when I abruptly packed my bags and moved to Alaska. So I'm, you know, that's where I'm sitting at the moment. Um, Brian Ratliff is the ODFW district wildlife biologist in Baker. Um, and he's done the majority of the, the field work here in the, in the more recent time and throughout this, the course of this project. So an uh, incredible amount of work that they've been, been doing on this project, as you'll see. And he's gonna he's online today too, and is gonna help with the, the question and answer session and then pick up anything I miss. And I'm just doing this to repay my, my debt to Brian. Um, geography. Here we are along the uh, border between Oregon and Idaho. Um, but the Burt River herd is the in the western on west of I-84 here, uh, south of ba the town of Baker City. Um, Lookout Mountain is sort of along the Brownlee Reservoir, which is uh, um, behind the a dam on the Snake River. And I, actually, I'll just point out that both of these herds are, they're about, Ah, 10 miles apart, roughly, maybe even a little less now. Um, and it's fairly, um, you know, moderately rugged topography between the two. Um, and they're divided by that Interstate 84 is the, the large yellow line there. A little bit of background here to, to start off. Um, a lot of agency and partnerships in this project. Um, we have, you know, mile, um, small number of staff that have been working on it from the, the CTYR, um, the ODFW, uh, with funding from both of those agencies. Um, we received a tribal wildlife grant to the tribes that's still ongoing. So we're, we're still uh, using that funding towards these projects. Um, the Oregon Wild Sheep Foundation has contributed financially to the Wild Sheep Foundation through the grant and aid program and the BLM. We've also collaborated with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, Hell's Canyon Initiative, and WDFW. So I'll speak a little bit to the background of these two herds of sheep. Um, like everything in Oregon, as Scott Torland mentioned earlier, earlier uh, bighorns were extirpated from the state. So both of these are reintroduced. Um, at the time, uh, these the Burnt River were the California subspecies of bighorn um, and were transplanted in 1987 and 97 with sheep from Leslie Gulch in Oregon and another herd in Nevada. Um, Lookout Mountain, our Rocky Mountain bighorns, and that, that transplant occurred in 93, 94 with wild horse uh, island sheep from Montana. Um, Pre-MOV um, outbreak, Population estimates were about 100 in Burnt River, 400 in Lookout Mountain, and both of those populations are currently decreasing. Um, I'll point out, that, uh, unlike some of the other um, herds of sheep in this, that you'll hear about today, our, I, I would classify our accessibility to these two areas as fairly good for uh, bighorn sheep populations. Both have some level of road access um, typically along the bottom of the canyons. Um, there's a, a river road, gravel road along the Snake River and Brownlee Reservoir that provides some vehicular access. And as well as there's a, a river road in uh, Burt River. And both of those are pretty much open year round. Um, and there's a good amount of BLM um, in public land base to work from and cooperative um, Brian has really good relationships with many of the landowners in both of these areas. So working 
across um, property boundaries um, hasn't been a big issue to my knowledge. And our elevation ranges are from about 2,700 to 5,000 feet for Burnt River and a little bit larger range for Lookout Mountain. And both of these um, habitat areas are pretty, pretty arid generally as it, most of Eastern Oregon is. Um, so pr prior to MOV um, introduction, there was some um, capture work that was done that where we had some sampling done and PCR tests and ELISA tests. So 2019, there was 10 um, sheep were captured in Burnt River with GPS collars and in Lookout was 2013 and 2014, they caught 42 sheep. Um, prior and over the about previous 20 years, the average um, lambs per hundred ewes was about 36 and 37. Um, they're pretty much one herd, not a lot of sub, sub herd dynamics. And right now it's very likely that the MOV spillover occurred in Burnt River during the summer or early fall of 2020. And it's slightly before that in Lookout Mountain in late 2019 and early 2020. Um, and both these herds do share the same strain of MOV. So when we put this project together, Brian and I were only talking about one herd of Lookout Mountain, and then we had another outbreak and then just folded this one into the mix. Um, so similar, I guess early on, similar um, all age mor mortality estimates sitting around 40%. Um, the prevalence um, from testing in the first year, we had very high in Burt River, 67%. Obviously, they're a little earlier in the disease progression where we were capturing. So we started capturing in, in late winter of 2020, 2021, early 2021, um, with just those part 10 individuals that had functioning collars. So we weren't catching new sheep. We were catching sheep that had been collared and tested in 2019, um, again in 2021. In Lookout Mountain, um, we had an 8% MOV prevalence on PCR. Um, both are domestic sheep strain types, and our most recent population estimates are, are shown there, 60 and 250. Um, the only other of note, um, other pathogens identified as a suspect uh, sinus nasal tumor in, from both um, herds and, and necropsy from some of the either mortalities or removals. Um, project planning, um, obviously, these are important groups of sheep for both um, tribal harvest, state hunters, general viewing public. Um, and Brian and I got together and talked about this extensively over the, the summer before we started the, back in 2020. Um, we both had similar goals, recover this population as you know, quote, quickly as possible um, through clearing MOV and, and increasing lamb survival. Now we both had the same you know, thought that if we did nothing, um, and based on our experience in Hell's Canyon, we would be stuck with decades of, of low lamb recruitment and suppressed population growth. And so we decided that we would do something and try to try to take action um, and apply this test and remove um, wow. process to both Burnt River and Lookout Mountain and realizing that we would probably not be able to replicate previous efforts where they caught nearly 100% of adult use. So we're going into this to try something new and um, we'll see where it goes. Um, as far as implementation, um, we start out with our sort of our first goal was to capture and test 40 to 50% of the adult use in the population and a smaller number of rams. So we're kind of sitting right at about 15% of our capture is, has been in rams. Um, of generally younger age class. Um, we're using ground darting and helicopter net gunning as needed. Um, we are using, we're gonna remove chronic carriers after two positive tests separated by at least 12 months. 
Um, we are not retesting any animals that are negative on their first capture and test. Um, we do retest indeterminates. And as far as assessing our success in this project, um, we're looking at lamb to you ratios during survey work. And then of course, down the road, the absence of antibody to MOV in lambs or yearlings. And of course the negative, hopefully negative PCR tests as well. And as far as timeline, I've touched on it a little bit. Um, we initiated this project in summer of 2020. Um, capturing began late late 2020, early 2021 in Burnt, or, uh, Lookout Mountain and later in Burnt River. Um, when it was fall, fall of 2020 that the die-off began in Burnt River. We detected that through some lamb mortality and then a hunter um, harvested ram that was swabbed and came back positive. Um, the majority of our capturing work occurred last capture season, so October through February of 21-22, and we are continuing to work on capture this year, and we'll be continuing mon to monitor lamb survival more intensively, hopefully this season and following seasons, and probably longer, as we all have heard today. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about statistics and of what we've um, accomplished to date. Um, as I mentioned, we in year one, the captures were a little bit smaller because we were kind of acting quickly. So we had nine in Burnt River and 24 in Lookout. And then year two, 30 sheep in Burnt River and 114 in Lookout. Um, our prevalence was much lower on PCR in Burnt River and Lookout. Last year, Lookout Mountain was zero. We had zero positive PCR tests in 114 sheep. Um, and our ELISA prevalence was about 100% across the board, except this last year, it's probably around 85 to 90% in Lookout. I had 81 there, but it's actually probably a little higher because I'm missing a few test results. In each herd last year, we had three recaptures of animals that were positive from 2020. Um, and in each group, one of those recaptures was uh, positive again and was removed. And as far as our observed lamb to you, um, in Burt River, it was zero in year one. And this year, there's reports of maybe one lamb seen, but in, in Brian's survey work, it was zero. Um, and Lookout Mountain, also very low. Um, looks like 2.5 in, uh, that would have been 2021, and then this season was 3.3. So extremely low um, lamb recruitment, even though we have a really low prevalence rate, which is troubling because, as you can see, we're looking for the, really looking for a needle in a haystack here. So I just want to talk about a little bit about the strategy we're kind of developing to help us um, harness some of the data that we're generating in this project, given that we're not going to catch every single U on the landscape, especially in Lookout Mountain, because there are a lot of them. Um, we have currently have 52 GPS collars that are on two fixes a day, collecting on the, the same uh, schedule. So, and, and trying to harness some of that data and, and use it in a, a way to help guide our capture work maybe in the, in, down the road. And this, as we had the first set of GPS collars out, we started to notice there was, you know, a, a pattern at some time of the year where some of these groups of ewes were using separate, you know, were geographically um, separate um, with small overlaps in their home range. And this is, this sort of typified, I've got a um, graphic here with two, two individual ewes, that's their entire year, one year of data, um, standard kernel home range. Um, so these, these two had a little bit of overlap periodically, but generally during the lambing season, and then spent the rest of the year kind of in separate zones. And so this, this was typical of a pattern that sort of emerged as things developed. And so once we started piling the collars and the data, this is example of a point cloud, we started to think, how can we look at the social networking of these animals, given we've got so much information coming in every day? 
So we, I started to look at, Brian and I talked about this, how can we use this to help us? So we're looking at the, a dynamic interaction statistic that accounts for attractance or avoidance between animals, displacement and direction of travel between sequential fixes. Um, this gets run through a clustering algorithm on a network analysis of the pairwise um, DI stat. So basically it's a, a 52 by 52 matrix at the moment, and we can do that for any given time period of interest. And what we can what we notice is certainly their their the way that these animals group and socialize changes and look out over time. Um, in here's an example from May to June, pumps out, you know, about five, four to five nice large U groups. And this changes by winter, it's much less. The groups are larger um, during the rut in winter time, they're much more congregated. So and as an example, we'd had poor lamb recruitment this year, so it wasn't really, and we didn't have a lot of field work time, but um, we did, this was an interesting observation into how something we might use in the future. Um, this particular group of collared sheep here shown in the green box was the only one where we observed lambs in June when we were surveying. And then again, in October, they, this particular animals in that group were observed with live lambs. The rest of them had no lambs. Um, a little bit about Burnt River. There, that canyon is pretty narrow. Most of the home ranges look uninteresting and have a high degree of overlap. Um, however, when we do run the same analysis based on their social networking, it does pull some groups, even though we only had nine ewes collared. So there is some potential down the road, I think, using this information, but of course we had no lamb survival, so there wasn't much to use it for. Um, moving forward, um, we're in the process of capturing more sheep as we speak. Um, another 15 in Burnt River, which I think Brian has done most of, um, or some of, and then 33 more in Lookout with another 20 GPS and some VHF collars. And we'll continue, of course, to remove any chronic carriers that we identify. And Brian just told me today that five of the 12 recaptures in Burnt River were PCR positive. So really interesting and sort of disappointing result that three years later, we still have a fairly high uh, prevalence of MOV there. And of course we need to bump up our field monitoring during the spring lambing period and the summer months. I think that'll be important um, going forward, trying to figure out if we have any patterns of um, where we might detect our chronic carriers and especially in lookout because we will have a good, you know, over 50% of the ewes will be collared. Hopefully we can kind of hone in on that a little bit. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, continue our social network analysis to help um, target our cap capture efforts, maybe change our capture timing, you know, when the animals are more segregated into groups so we can identify potential um, chronic carriers. Um, of course, eventually we'll test lambs for exposure when survival increases. I'm going to use when, not if, because I'm optimistic. Um, and some takeaways. Public outreach is a must. Um, make sure, you know, your message wants to be the first one to hit the media. I think, um, you know, just Brian did an outstanding job with this um, in both his local media and the state media and ODFW's media channels. Um, we had a um, joint uh, press release between ODFW and the tribe when we detected MOV in um, Burnt River. So a lot of partnerships, um, that's super key, as you've heard throughout this morning session. Um, large population testing is an overwhelming task. And um, I think Brian can speak to that better than anyone right now as far as we have a lot of adult uh, sheep left in Lookout Mountain, and it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty daunting. And I think you know one of the things we did, you know, it's maybe especially evident in Burnt River is that we jumped on it really quickly and started capturing and testing, and we still have a really high prevalence rate. So maybe it would have been better to hold off a year or two before we started working in there. But I think it, since we were already working in Lookout. We had the same strain of MOV. We just 
went for it. So, and I think Brian will be on if I can, either of us can answer any questions because that's about what I got. Thank you, Scott. Any questions for Scott or Brian? Okay, got a couple. I don't know, is this still on? Yeah. Yeah, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more of this about the social network analysis. Seems like a really interesting way to potentially solve the problem of these large populations. And I'm curious, is that an internal thing that you guys are doing the analysis for, or are you working with the university? I guess my understanding is it's fairly complex, but maybe it's maybe it's less complex than I'm thinking. Sure. Um, I, it's something that I've just been working on here, and um, it's. I mean, I, I can. I answer anything you want about it later or, or now. It's just we're using. I'm just basically harnessing the the, the daily GPS fixes and and looking at you know pro, it's basically a, a weighted calculation between the association index and the dynamic interaction index, which sort of accounts for um, their trajectory and direction and displacement kind of just seeing how how similar are how close are fixes together and how similar are their direction and displacement to each other and then you once you calculate that statistic for every pair of animals in the data set for whatever piece of time you're interested in then you run another it's I'm doing all this in R and it run, I run through another social networking analysis that kind of figures out uh, these nodes and ends and figures out who's most related to who. And then it, you run it through a clustering algorithm and it gives you the, the clusters of, of groups and by association. So you that dendrology tree that you're used to seeing. I can probably click back to that maybe. So just to follow on that, are you then yeah. that tree, are you identifying those groups then in the summer that do have lambs? Or I guess, are you classifying ewes individually by whether or not they have an individual lamb? Or I guess, how are you relating that lamb survival to that? That's right now, it's just basically been observation. And we've had so few lambs that it, I think with the framework is here, but we just haven't had enough you know, visual data stream, survey data stream to help us because we're not, we haven't had the staffing power to be out there watching each of these collared animals when they're you when their lambs are born when they may die and you know so we've, we've had this once one or two snapshots in time saying okay this group here in the green box you know we, we saw that there was multiple animals in there that had lambs still in june and then a few of them in august in october um I wish I had a more detailed data stream to relate this to, but th at this point, it's more of like, here's what we can do with it. How can it help us? So we know that we know that sometime, you know, we, the hypothesis is, and there was, you know, some observation earlier in the season that most of these ewes had lambs. The pregnancy rate was high, birth rate was high. They were dead by mid-June. So when we were out there surveying, we saw, I think I, I was the observer for the most of the green box here. Luckily, Brian saw, I think 30 or 40 collared animals and no lambs. So they were already gone by then. So we just need to figure out how to work our visual surveys into this. And maybe it would help us down the road, especially if we can, if our lamb survival increases and we can kind of, and we'll have, another 20 GPS collars. So we'll have 72 animals or I think a few collars have gone offline, but we'll have a few, we'll have a larger sample, more collared animals, and we can kind of relate that back to where, where are we seeing survival, better survival of lambs and in, in what individual groups and how do these things change throughout the season? I, I hope I have answered your question a little bit. Yeah, I had a question regarding uh, the status of domestic sheep uh, allotments and herds, the past, present, and future in your study area. Sure. Um, there, there are a couple of BLM domestic sheep allotments 
in the vicinity. Um, they, I want to say, trying to remember the distance, but they, the, the one that's kind of in between and north of the two herd groups, I would classify as a, a higher risk allotment. Um, and then, of course, I mean, but there are private flocks that are closer. So there are there are domestic sheep along Interstate 84, right in between these two groups of bighorns. And you can see those when you drive between Boise and Baker City. Um, and there's other little farm flocks around and Brian can speak to those better. And he's um, he has tested some of them and has, you know, so they're they're the the they're present um, and closer than I think anyone would like, but we're doing our best with that. Hey Scott, it's Mike Cox. So hey Mike. with the 114 sampled ewes and no PCR positives and on lookout. Yep. Year, year two. And, yeah. So any any thoughts? Any crazy? reasons i testing was it legit i think i'm I, I need to look back and see how many indeterminates we had last year and maybe brian to jump in i think i don't know like there's just you know that the sheep look I, I would say healthy and um obviously the lambs die quickly but i think literally my theory right now is we're, we are trying to find just one or two um, chronic carriers that are probably sp spoiling the whole batch. But you showed these subgroups, these the views. Yep. Through the summer. I have a, a follow-up question. Okay, Francis has a follow-up. <laughs> follow <-up>, Francis. <laughs> there you go. There's a, doc uh, there's a doctor in the room, so you follow <laughs> Um, I think what one thing that's confusing is you have 114, and you said you have no PCR positives, but you said you have re recaptured one PCR positive and uh, removed it because it was positive again. Yes, that I guess that's you're right. The, those I think that might be 114 new. I have to look back at my data but i think that's that may be 114 new sheep not including the recaptures so right we did have in last season we had one pcr positive but it didn't persist on the landscape much more than a couple of weeks after we got the test result back so i think it was less than a month i think that was removed in this late winter yeah, Brian's saying correct, 114 new samples. Uh, Tim? Okay, I'd like to, uh, the fellow in front of me just asked the question about the domestic sheep there. And I think I'd like to bring up an important point and expand on the question a little bit. I think it's really important for everybody here to look at. But both the uh, Earth River and Lookout Mountain Herds, they helped start those in 91, 92. And we got really good populations. They took off and they pretty well stayed in those uh, two areas in the canyon country. We had uh, two dis uh, domestic sheep uh, situations that were one by Burnt Rivers about seven miles away. And it was uh, in town in a flat area. So there was flat distance between there and Burnt River. So we had pretty good. Uh, separation and low potential for mixing. And then the Lookout Mountain, we had a, the same situation. So there's elevation and space distance. And so we got, it looks like 30 years of production in both of those herds without any disease. And that's pretty darn good. So you have to look at the risk of disease transmission, when you're going to have a problem. Is it five years, 10 years, 15, 20? You have to look at how many years you're going to get of good populations. So 
when you do test and remove, you need to kind of evaluate how much you're going to get out of this, what benefit it is. And test and remove is just part of a sheet management, a bigger picture. And so we felt pretty good that we got 30 years out of this, and we thought that a domestic sheet disease transmission um, potential for mixing is pretty low. We finally got caught after 30 years or whatever. So that's just what I'm saying. No, I, that, I think that's that's a good point. And I'm, Tim, I think that's um, something that went through the back of my mind. I'm guessing Brian's too. When we went through this and talked about it, it was like, you know, do we apply this much force? Yes, because it's been a good run in the past and the potential for both of these herds, especially look out to, to rebound um, seemed to like to justify the effort. And the fact that we were continuing the, you know, sort of the outreach effort, and I hope that will build um, going forward. Can I go back, Tom? Um, just to follow up, and, and maybe I missed this in here, I was trying to follow all the numbers. I'm curious, what has that population trend been since they were introduced? And did, did the population reach a point where, it increased in size and distribution sufficiently that that, that led to more contact with domestic sheep. Do we know that? Did I miss that? Um, I'll I'll let Brian jump on talk about the population um, over time and space use. I think the un it's unknown how um, MOB was introduced into the lookout sheep. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah, so that's a good question. So in the Burt River, after it was reintroduced, it grew steadily to about 70 to 80 individuals and then just held at that level and was at that level when they finally got MOE. The Lookout Mountain Herd grew substantially and actually the last few years right before they got sick, we were looking at bringing that population down because we were actually starting to see rams use areas that they had not used in the past. Um, in fact, we had it specifically slated for doing some capture there in 2019, but then they got sick that winter. So we kind of missed it by a few years. And I think that definitely had a, um, the population size definitely had an effect on the Lookout Mountain on the areas they were using. We also started seeing a little bit of movement between sh of sheep between the Burnt River and Lookout Mountain when that population got big. And I think that's how we got the same strain in Lookout Mountain and Burr River. Do you have a lot of ram harvest in those populations? Yeah, I mean, we have significant ram harvest. I mean, we, you know, have our tags and then we always typically pick the auction and raffle tag up in Lookout Mountain. Um, but with that said, the, the ewe population had grown also. But as it got bigger, the animals started using newer areas and you know, in hindsight, we probably should have capped them at 300 instead of letting them grow up to four. We're all guilty of that. <laughs> yeah. Anything else for Scott or Brian? Okay. All right. Well, moving on, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so we'll have a little bit of a little bit of time for maybe a longer lunch break, but I'm bringing Francis back up to talk to us about data synthesis and logistics. And um, Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Thanks. Four. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about a survey uh, that Mike Cox spear spearheaded and with some input from other folks on this on the committee setting up this workshop about um, basically the purpose was to determine the number of test remover experiments there are, uh, where it's being implemented, and how it's being implemented. And in the future, uh, we definitely would like to know what the success rate is and maybe and look at factors that are associated with the success. So uh, we had uh, survey questions were in uh, several categories. One first category was the, the characteristics of the population, how big it was, uh, subspecies, uh, whether there was uh, where there were subgroups, kind of some of the things you've heard people talk about in their presentations, the disease history. And then the second uh, uh, section was on uh, how it was implemented, how what how were the sheep captured, how many uh, were captured, what kind of test results, how many sheep were removed, what were the criteria. We also asked questions about cost and effort. And finally, uh, the another thing we've been talking about is the risk management of spillover. What have is has anything been done to try to reduce the risk of a new spillover in conjunction with being tested? All of a sudden, this is really sensitive. Damn. Try a different strategy. Um, so there were. Um, has to remove the, the we didn't get everybody to uh respond to the survey um but what? really yeah i'm not even sure we asked everybody but um we got most uh, out of the 23 that i think there are we are this is covering 21 of them um and so we have eight states uh, washington oregon idaho montana wyoming south dakota nebraska and nevada and then uh british and province british columbia <clears throat> and we're missing uh, one of the test removes in Washington and then an automation. And all these, uh, we also asked people about what collaborators they had, and collaborators included universities, Forest Service, BLM, Department of Defense, and tribes. So I had uh, 11 in with Rocky Mountain, seven California, and three desert. In this uh, slide, the solid bars are Rocky Mountain. And then um, BC on the left there is California. Uh, Oregon had both uh, California and Rockies, and Washington also has is doing um, California and Rockies. And Nevada is California and deserts. And I would say that this was a Google Sheets document that people, um, you know, filled out, which was great. Um, sometimes I think people interpreted questions differently or didn't answer all the questions. And sometimes I had a little bit of difficulty interpreting people's answers. So I'm putting some numbers up here, and I think they're kind of ballpark. But keep in mind that they're, um, this is kind of a work in progress. So the median population size was 63 sheep, but the range was from 25 sheep in Custer State Park to 800 in the Fraser River. And then because of this wide range in numbers of sheep, there was also a wide range in numbers of groups from one in a lot of uh, uh, populations and then 18 in the Fraser. Uh, the land rate U ratio prior to implementing test Remove uh, the median was 0.16 lambs per U for recruitment, and the range is 0 to 0.3. The years since the original outbreak, where people knew what it was, uh, median of eight, and people were working on populations that, like the lookout, was two years, um, lookout mountain, and um, whiskey was 31 years after the original outbreak. 
And the population decline in the during the outbreak, median of about 40%, but a wide range of 5% to 85%. And most populations had one MLE strain, some had two, and then Nebraska had up to five. <laughs> Way to go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Proud of that one. <laughs> um, so the really capture method, most people use helicopter net gun um, or combination of helicopter net gun and ground darting, and then one was just ground darting. Most uh, people were putting on both VHF and GPS collars with individual marks like ear tags, um, but some people were just using GPS and individual marks and some just VHF. And then most people were testing RAMs, but like I mentioned, probably not as intensively as used, and then some people were not. Um, in a few cases, people were doing non-selective culls as well as um, the test to remove, but most of the cases, no. And then uh, most people are using the two, two test definition for carriers. Um, some people, as you heard, use one, and then I think Chad said in, they removed an indeterminate from Deadwood. I guess just to be sure. Maybe other people have removed indeterminates too. Um, I think that the sort of median, there, a lot of these projects haven't been completed, so there's not a very big sample size here, but median duration was three years with five, up to five years plus. Um, I think the snowstorms have been five plus years, and there's been others as well. Um, the total captures median was 53, but anywhere from this is per population and some of these uh, questions that brought up, or some of the responses brought up the uh, uh, thought in my mind about how people are defining populations. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the responses we're seeing, but also I think that's maybe something we want to think about as we go forward is what are we considering um, a population and how does that you know, how, did, what, how does that matter in terms of how successful we're going to be? Um, but anyway, so that is why I think Nebraska has some pretty small populations. So there was one they had um, two that they've tested from Sao Valley and, um, and then, uh, you know, hundreds in, in Health Canyon and Fraser River. And the median MOE prevalence was 11% with a range of zero. 75%, also in Nebraska. <laughs> um, and the number of sheep that were removed um, has been pretty low, but I think up 35 in Fraser River. And then I think in snow, uh, also snowstorms have been about 22, something like that. And the land rate view ratio, in those populations that um, have um, cleared MOB has been, this recruitment has been about 0.45 median with a range of 0.3 to 0.62. For instance, was that like within one year or was there some defined time after testing removal? Um, This is just, it wasn't defined. Yeah, no, it was not. not. <laughs> <laughs> what? Somebody, Chad? Oh, Chad. You yeah, can. it could be more than one year, right? Yeah, some people lumped and some people, I'm not sure. <clears throat> and then finally, for the spillover risk management, a lot of people didn't answer this question, even for jurisdictions I know that have spillover risk management, but at least seven populations. There was some form of education outreach. Uh, Nebraska has a, putting together a working group of flock owners um, to, to for uh, Bighorn Health um, and then testing domestic sheep and goats. 
And then there were some populations that are, they did not, they were not aware of any um, domestic sheep or goats in the area. And so they had not done any outreach. So that's all I have. And I uh, really want to thank everybody that filled out the, the Google Sheets. I know it was time consuming and um, but it's really good information. I think it was a good start to giving an overview. And I hope that we can move forward with this. Um, you know, I hope this is useful to people. I guess that's a question I have. And um, if so, we can move forward, perhaps making a, a survey that's a little easier to fill out and to interpret, or you know, building on this survey, and then maybe also um, do some more, some sort of joint data analysis to, to get a little, a little deeper into the needs. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Francis. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Kind of gives us a snapshot how things have gone here here to four, at least with some of the work that's been done. Did you have something else, Francis, oh, real quick? No, for questions. Any questions? Start in the front, <laughs> and then we'll get, get to the back. So, Francis, um, in terms of the level of PCR prevalence, you know, I mean, all your research kind of led up to that somewhere like 5% or less of the population is going to be positive, PCR positive after X number of years. Um, and that's why it, it seems like it's a fruitful effort when there's that few left, you just got to find them. What did, what did, you showed 11% was kind of the average uh, prevalence, uh, which are, there was a lot of range, but what's, what's your thoughts on the variability that you saw in, in the data? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I do want to, before I answer the question, I wanted to just add a few things that I forgot to say that we asked, because there was a lot in there that I didn't show. And one of them um, was not only prevalence, but the the um, classification of the sheep that uh, were tested and um, the test that we used, which almost everybody used Waddle except um, Wyoming. This is why they gave a fish lab and BC also used Waddle, but also their Abbotsford lab. And then several, several jurisdictions used the um, Used Waddle or, or another lab and Biomeme, but I think there's very few um, you heard today from Nate that they used Biomeme to make decisions, but most people did not use Biomeme to make decisions, even if, even if they used it. So I don't think that's a factor, the, the testing itself in the range. I think, I think there, in my opinion, looking at the data, it seems that there is a lot of variability in this disease. Like they can. When you say positive, even if they're positive year after year, I think there's um, changes in the infection prevalence and the seroprevalence that are going on. So this, this infection may be um, in, increasing and then waning and then increasing and waning over time. And so that's, that's what I see when I look at the data. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Andy. So I'm going to re-ask the same question I asked this morning with more data to bear now. So we've seen a, a median of 11% and a range from 0 to 75%. And it looks like 10 to 60% is pretty common in PCR prevalence in these, in, in these studies we've seen today. Um, and so my question, where's the cutoff or threshold where you go from test and remove to wait. And so clearly at 10%, test and remove would be the, the path forward. What about 25 or 30 or 50? Then where do we move into the, oh, we better just wait two years and retest later after the, this is run its course? Well, I think a lot of that is dependent on the person doing the test and remove. Um, and so, and like I said, there's just really different scenarios. And one thing that was brought up with Nevada was they were just really worried about 
an adjacent population that was going to get infected and they didn't see, uh, you know, the, I'm not saying that their population they're working in wasn't high value, but it wasn't irreplaceable. And so um, they were willing to do test and remove perhaps in a higher, in a more aggressive way than um, in another situation. Francis, wouldn't, wouldn't your criteria also play into that decision-making regardless of the prevalence rate that those views, like if you still get individuals that test twice, why wouldn't you continue to remove them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there I'm can not... still be chronic carriers or shedders at low prevalence rate, right? Assuming definitely, there definitely are. So maybe I'm not, maybe, are you asking whether it's yeah, possible I'm, I'm wondering to do, or? Yeah, I'm wondering if there's a threshold between and, and I, I'm just throwing out examples between 20 and 30 and 40, 50 percent where you don't want to go in and do test and removal because it's really not the best tool at that. And, and you know, I'm kind of I didn't see anybody in their methods or procedures say at this cutoff, we're going to wait. And at this cutoff, we're not. Or are they just, at, you know, and this goes back to my, my original wag of 50 percent. I didn't hear people say they are or are not going to remove at these high 50, 75 percent. Maybe everybody's just removing everything at two positives. Well, I don't think. Um, yeah, I guess it just depends on. Yeah. Um, and you certainly could wait if you had, you know, if, if, I think I don't think that's an answerable question. That's why I have to keep asking. Okay. Because okay. <laughs> okay. anybody else want to comment on this? I, I totally agree. We don't know enough. I was just gonna say it depends. I was gonna say to me it would depend on how many years if you know it from the spillover. If you're at fifty percent a year after the spillover, it might be worth it to wait. If you're at ten years, then you know it's not the, so I think you have to take in the time of for the outbreak to occur and kind of determine are you still in the midst of that outbreak? And in which case it you might want to wait, but so I think there's a lot of other factors. Hold on, we're going to the that's going to depend. Okay. So add to the it depends. Burn. Uh, yeah, Francis. Uh, Twenty-one of your twenty-three uh, people or or agencies responded. Uh, what proportion of these were working with native populations versus reintroduced populations, and that might be. Founding size might be something you're looking for in your demographic information. Yeah, that's good. I don't think we did we ask that. We have subspecies, but I don't think we have that on there. I, there are both natives like Idaho and Wyoming have you know, other native populations, but and probably are any of your deserts that you're doing it in, Nina? You know? And you'd have many years of reintroduction on some and newer ones. There'd yeah. be a huge range there, I think, for the reintroduction time frame, even. Yeah. So and we did. We don't have that, um, but there is a range. Yeah. Yeah. My impression was though that maybe seventy-five percent of these were uh, reintroduced populations or introduced populations versus twenty-five percent as being native. Is that a reasonable guess? Well, I think. It's possible, but it's probably not because they're necessarily because they're reintroduced. It's just that most people are doing smaller populations, and a lot of those are reintroduced. Okay, I was just curious from a you know population origin perspective. Thank you. A new column to the spreadsheet, and <laughs> so just just a, a comment on the question regarding you know at what prevalence rate or do we do we remove sheep in a population if we've got fifty percent prevalence to add to Nate's it depends. Um, so in Arizona we have a couple of populations that are thriving and have been thriving for years with MOV present presence present and. I, you know, I think in, again, we go back to strain type and virulence makes a difference. And, you know, so we aren't planning on doing any kind of test and remove and wouldn't 
regardless of the prevalence rate, as long as those populations continue to thrive. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Um, yep. However, right. we've had right. some right. new strains introduced into some of these, into one of these populations. It's so large that I think touch and remove would be very difficult, if not impossible. Um, and it does seem to be recovering from that introduction and all age die off. Which just remains to be seen where we stand in another four or five years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else? What else on your mind? Ellen? I just remind people that there's three more presentations coming up this afternoon that, that have a little bit more history than these ones that came in this morning. And I think some of your questions might be answered through that. Fair to say? Yeah, we started with the new ones, but yeah. the ones that have been finished somewhat yeah. are new. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is anybody hungry? Well, well, hold on. I, I was getting to you, but <laughs> go ahead, Kevin. Oh, thank you, Francis. Um, and so, hey, Francis. Hey. So Scott and Brian presented remotely. You guys didn't get any applause. So. Love you anyway. Um, oh, thanks, Kevin. A couple things that I wanted to mention um, before we turn everybody loose in the hall. The uh, pizza should be here momentarily. Uh, there'll be soft drinks, etc. Like I said, we didn't budget for this, so if you guys feel guilty and want to throw a five or ten in the collection bin, it's kind of like church. Um, we appreciate it. we didn't have this in the budget, but. We'll cover it. Karen put it on her card. We'll get her reimbursed. But anyhow, um, before we release everybody, because you might trickle back in or some folks may opt to stay out in the hall and visit with friends they haven't chatted with in a while, I wanted to ask Jesse Bowen for British Columbia to come up. Jesse's the filmmaker on transmission, this 53-minute film that we're going to watch. So what uh, I'd like to do is ask Jesse to just give a little bit of background about it and then... Um, We'll release folks, go out, grab something, come back in. That way, Jesse, there'll be time on Mike's computer to tee that up. And a 53 minute runtime, you know, it's going to push us pretty close to our one o'clock start time again. So um, we will stay on time. But uh, Jesse, if you could come up and just give a little snippet about transmission and uh, sort of the circuit you've been on and what, what the impact has been so far. Certainly, thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, so we've got this film called Transmission. I know there's people in this room that have seen it before. Um, oh, yeah, swallow the mic, right? Right, Francis? Um, so we were, I'm a filmmaker by trade, and it might be weird to see a filmmaker in a room of scientists, but um, through making this film, Transmission, I keep pointing over that way because usually the film's up when I'm talking, um, but uh, through making the film, that was my connection to Wild Sheep. Uh, I spent four years making the film thanks to COVID for delaying things, but um, it's really a benefit for, for where we're at. So um, what we wanted to do was create, we talked about education and awareness and outreach and, and all those kinds of things and, and how do we engage with the general public, how do we engage with domestic uh, producers, all that kind of thing. So what we wanted to do was create a film that kind of outlined everything Educated people, we, we kind of take a baseline of a kindergarten level of education. So we get the basics of what Moby is, how it works, and then um, how it gets spread on the landscape and so on and so forth. So we did that through a film called Transmission. Um, it's not publicly released because we're going to the film festival circuit. Uh, we're just wrapping up. We've um, won two Best Environmental Documentary Awards. Uh, we're finalists in three festivals and uh, we've won an award for emotional impact. And we were finalists at the uh, Banff Mountain Film Festival, which we presented there. And we had a theater full of people that know nothing about wild sheep or very little uh, in tears. So it was uh, really good. I didn't see it again. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll aim to what time do you want to start at 12? That gives 20 minutes. Because um, it is 53 minutes. So how about let's start at five minutes till? noon and uh that'll give time for folks to okay 11 55 uh we'll start it um but uh i'm gonna 
stop talking now and oh, get back again. Yeah. Just just a comment. And we've been friends a long time, but you know, Helen will be signing autographs after the film. So she is the central character in this. No, <laughs> character is the truth. Yeah. So but no, it's a great film. I've seen it probably 10 or 12 times. We took this with Jesse's help and shortened it into a 15-minute one. We cut out a lot of the stop and the fluff, and we showed that to um 275 legislators from states in Bozeman, the first of, I guess it was on December 1st, but very impactful. And so there's two versions out there. We thought that legislators would have a short attention span. So we had Jesse tighten it down and that's been impactful. But this 53 minute tells the whole story. Yeah, Ashley. After uh, you're done with the circuit of uh, film festival, will it be made available? Yeah, so right now it's we're probably looking about April will be online. Uh, then we've got broadcast deals as well. So it'll be broadcast on TV and, and online. Let's go eat lunch. Yeah, good. Thank you. Hey, Jesse. Yeah, Bill. See you, man. Been working hard. Always. <laughs> Always. I don't know any other way. <laughs> well, it keeps it interesting. Yeah, I'm here gathering content for Washington. I don't know yet. Either way, if I can't make it, then I'll do whatever we need to do to. I'll always try to do yeah, okay. That, I don't think it, we got it. We're gonna have to give Zach more lead. Let's get together. Yeah, I was talking to Carl. I'm just not sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, let's move the photos back. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Take one first. Take yeah. one first. Yeah. Yeah. Turn the loader down.
Go ahead and continue, and they'll ch they'll chime in. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Kate Hybert, and I'm the third Rocky Creek Chair uh, at Washington State University. And my co-author is Dr. Tom Besser. I think he's online, um, and he was the second Rocky Creek Chair. And so we're going to talk about something that's super important, but not super emotionally compelling, and that's testing. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. You got to use it. Tell me how to eat the microphone. Okay, so our goal is to detect the presence of mycoplasma over pneumonia, or MOE, from bighorn sheep nasal swabs. Uh, we're going to talk today about lab-based PCR tests, labs that offer them, um, who, what, how long, and importantly, how much does it cost, uh, some merits and challenges of, of all of the, the different um, techniques, and some outstanding questions or issues that we want to tackle in the future. And then we'll talk about potential animal side tests, which is really exciting. Um, you've heard a little bit about biomine, and so we'll dig into that one first. And then talk about two other animal side tests called LAMP and RPA. And then we wanted to just briefly touch on post removal testing, at least the serology part of that, um, uh, ever so briefly. So that's where we're headed. <clears throat> we're going to start out with these lab based PCR tests. As mo most everyone knows, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, is a copy machine for DNA. Um, and what we want out of this is an individual swab's MOVI DNA status. Um, we have two different flavors, conventional PCR and then real-time PCR. And real-time PCR happens in real time. That's why we really like it. So in, uh, the idea, we collect a swab, we extract DNA from the material on the swab. So we extract DNA from um, the, the bacteria and other things that are in that snot. And then we want to amplify or copy that uh, DNA and then determine the uh, MOV DNA status. And on the right hand side here, you see the CT is less than or equal to 36, indicates that it was detected. 36 to 40 indicates indeterminate and greater than 40 not detected. And so what that is, those are uh, the cycle threshold. So PCR goes through many cycles. And if there's a lot of bacterial DNA early on, you don't need very many cycles to amplify it enough to actually detect it. <clears throat> so that's why a lower CT indicates uh, a detection earlier. Okay. When we look at the lab-based PCR tests for MOV from swabs, we have four main labs. These are accredited diagnostic labs. So Waddle, the Washington Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab in Pullman, Washington. Um, the Animal Health Center in Abbotsford, PDS, the Prairie Diagnostic Services in Saskatoon, and uh, Kansas State's uh, Vet Diagnostic Lab. And what we did was to, to look online and have conversations with, with the labs the best we could to find out what method they're using. And so the method column here, everyone is using real-time PCR. Waddle, um, Abbotsford, and PDS are all using the what we call the, mod, the Man Love Modified Waddle PCR. So there was a slight modification that Kezia Man Love and colleagues published in 2019. Prairie Diagnostic, um, they've detected some cross detection of another mycoplasma, and so they follow up anything 
any of their tests with um, any of their positive tests with conventional PCR and then sequencing to figure out if it's MOV or if it's something else. And then K-State is using uh, a different but uh, real-time uh, PCR protocol. I've listed here two costs per swab. Um, so ranging from 35 Canadian at Abbotsford to uh, nearly $53 a bottle. Interestingly, as we all know, turnaround time is really important. So somewhere between um, one to two business days, three to five days, four to 10 days. Abbotsford right now, as I understand it, is recovering from their flood. And so the turnaround time is, is, is long. Um, there are stat options, as we know. So for an extra fee, we can get that processed a little bit faster. Okay. Um, you know, maybe a question will come up about other labs. And I know that at Wyoming King Fish, um, I don't have information about their stuff, but we could probably talk about that with, with folks who, who are in the know. Okay, what are the merits? These are published protocols, published methods in accredited labs. So you don't have to worry about things like dirt, soil, that sort of stuff. Um, we know that real-time PCR is very sensitive and specific, so it's given us a good test. It's been used successfully for testing or new, um, as we'll hear about <clears throat> later this afternoon. Some of the challenges, cost, you saw some of those numbers. 50 bucks a sample is um, a lot when you start accumulating a lot of samples and turnaround time, particularly when we're talking about test and remove. <clears throat> Some of our outstanding questions um, in, in conversations in particular with Kylie, uh, doing something like a ring test where we do a standardized comparison among the labs would be really valuable um, to ask that question. Why are we getting some, some weird results every once in a while? Try to get at the heart of that. And also to ask if there are research labs that um, are doing very similar or the same protocols with uh, repeatability and, and success. Okay. Potential animal side tests. This, this gets exciting. So Biomean is the first of these. This is real-time PCR. This is Sherry in, um, in the tent. <laughs> Uh, doing operation, she has two biomine machines there. Uh, in, in this case, we get something that's called the CQ value. It's very similar to this CT value. Uh, instead of um, maybe a yes or no or something that you might get spit out of a computer, you have to interpret this graph. And we saw a picture of one of those graphs in the video in the film, and it was really um, quite striking to get this really strong S-shaped curve, and we know that it's positive. The merits, it's field-friendly, has field-friendly extraction methods. It's this little box, and you step through the, the compartments in the box, and you extract the stuff off of the swab. And it's fast. Uh, challenges, um, right now there's a single vendor, and that's the Biomine Corporation. The cost has been changing recently. Um, yesterday, back in the envelope, cost $32 per sample. This does not include the Biomean machine or other startup costs, but still a little bit less expensive than some of the accredited labs. Seems like one of the challenges might be uh, it'd be nice to have a dedicated person, uh, technical personnel, someone dedicated to running the bio mean, that person cannot also be, um, you know, in charge of some portion of the capture or something like that. There's just way too much going on. Um, another challenge is that it's not the lab. And so you would have to worry about dirt on the swab. Um, you have to worry about temperature variations because you're out in the field. And so this is a picture of some swabs taken from uh, Bighorn in, in DC, right? And uh, that those dark ends to the swab should be a lot lighter than that. I mean, it's like almost entirely soil. <laughs> so that you, you run into some issues with that. Um, that's related to an outstanding question that can we can we improve the extraction process? Could we do um, studies where we say, okay, there's this much dirt on it, and this much dirt, and this much dirt. Um, 
additional work on uh, sensitivity and specificity. Uh, so we're starting to gather a lot of data on the use of biomeme. Bringing those data together and seeing what we can learn from them is going to be very important. And of course, importantly, comparisons, direct comparisons with uh, lab-based real-time PCR would be great. Another exciting uh, animal side test is, is called LAMP. Um, this is loop-mediated isothermal ampl amplification. So in PCR, the temperature goes up and down in those cycles. And in LAMP, it's isothermal, so it's the same temperature. This happens in a single tube. It uses enzymes instead of temperature changes. And it's kind of cool because what you get out of it is uh, a change in opacity of the, the liquid in the tube and also fluorescence. So in this picture on the left, um, those three tubes are positive and on the right, they're all negative. And so when you look at that, oh gosh, that's, that's, that's pretty great. We have some work still to do on it. Um, we, you know, we know it's fast. It's relatively inexpensive. Um, the challenges or the things that remain uh, to be done are to develop a field extraction method. So you still have to extract the DNA from the swab. Um, how do we do that in a reliable way so that you're, you're getting, you know, either a positive or a negative when you, when you do it there? And then adapting the test for field use. So far. This is work that's been done at the National Wildlife Health Center in, in a laboratory. So we need to work on uh, field applying it, if you will. Um, some outstanding questions. Are there inhibitors? So uh, things that are in the extract that might inhibit the, this uh, opacity and fluorescence change, uh, working out sensitivity and specificity, and then of course, validating it and comparing it among, among other tests. Uh, the last potential animal side test is RPA. This is a, another enzyme-related one. It's called recombinase polymerase amplification. It happens in a single tube. It also uses enzymes instead of temperature changes. And uh, you can detect changes in fluorescence. Or um, there's a publication out there, this Wang et al. 2020 paper, where they used the lateral flow strips which are what we're using when we do a home COVID test. So that would be really cool. Um, it'd be fast, straightforward. There's no extraction steps, so even fewer steps to the process. There's good concordance or good matching with real-time PCR um, in this Wang paper, and it seems to be specific and sensitive. That said, some of the reagents come from only a single source vendor in the UK. So there's some you know, potentially cost issues there and also access issues. And it needs to be adapted if, if it's going to be used at all um, uh, for use in the field. This is the less well-developed of all of these that, that we've talked about. Um, and then some outstanding questions, of course, formal comparison among tests. And then there may be other issues that we just haven't uh, gotten to or haven't really uh, thought about quite yet. Okay, so that's, um, those are all the testing part of the test and remove. So what about post-removal evaluation? Um, asking that question, have new animals or lambs uh, been exposed since the removal uh, treatment happened? This is based on a blood sample, so the serum from the blood sample using competitive ELISA. It's a population level metric. Um, and so you get the sample from you know, multiple animals in there and not exposed populations, you're gonna have less than 1% of the samples with detections and exposed populations 30 to 100% um, detections. And so what we're hoping for is that after the removal, you have uh, less than 1% of your samples from those newbies with detected antibodies, suggesting that they have not been exposed to MOV. Um, this is great. It's highly specific for MOV. Um, there's a high percent of detection in those exposed populations. Okay, that's, that's good. It's telling us that it's worked. 
And on the other side, the lambs that are born after the test and remove, um, we find that they're not detected. Great. Challenges is that when uh, we're interpreting some of those intermediate numbers of detections, it's a little bit hard to know what's happening there. Um, could be that there, there are weaning antibodies um, in a recently cleared population. Um, so that's you know one of the one of the challenges there. Um, some outstanding questions, and it, it might be that some strains uh, of MRE may not stimulate the antibody in the test. Um, so the test in that case would be uh, less useful or something for us to, to, to work on some of those strain variation questions. Okay, I think we're like yes. spot on for questions yeah. and, and conversation. And Tom, if you're there, um, and, you, and I need you to chime in, I will let you know. <laughs> Before we go there, oh, sorry, I wanted to just acknowledge that a, a lot of people have been really gracious with their, their knowledge. Karen Fox, Caitlin Ferricks, Eric Hoffmeister, Kirsten Loiva, Michelle Musel, and a special shout out to Kylie I'm back there for her recent and very um, rapid turnaround on my questions. I had a couple of questions. I was like, oh yeah, here it is. So thank you very much for that. And if you're interested in these um, papers that we referenced, these are the how to find them, and I'm also happy to send it to you. Good luck. Yeah, good. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. Questions for Kate? Ma'am. Hey, have you got any kind of an answer right now to how how long um, an, an, a moldy antibody is going to be present in, in a sheet? I do not have an answer. Um, I'll kick it back to others who, who might have an answer like that. Yeah. Um, I do have a few uh, captive big horns, and um, we've been, every time we handle those guys, we've been um, grabbing serum from them, and they still have the antibodies since their um, exposure in 2015. I think that's right. Okay. So, but you know, small sample size. I I'm new to their histories. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Barry, there there yeah. was a um a young animal at I think the Palm Desert Zoo uh, that was tested that was came in sick and survived, and then they tested it at like six years that still had it. With this consistent with yeah. 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 But I have another question for you. If, has anyone tried rinsing with just saline a dirty nose? And does that decrease the does that wash off all of the MOV DNA at the same time it might rinse out um, dirt and dust and debris? Well, the has. When we do our BC presentation, we've got some lessons learned, and we have been using BioMeme plus two labs, as you discussed. Mm -hmm. And and our our technician Sherry has come up with some really important points and worked through them with BioMeme. So I don't think anybody's rinsed a nose first with fear of removing the bacteria, but we 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 are having much better success with dirty noses and dirty swabs. Excellent. And that likely has to do with the extraction process. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah. So one other question regarding antibodies. So how long do maternal antibodies last? Excellent question. I do not know. Anybody else? Let's look. Yeah. So I mean yeah, six weeks years. testing of the lambs afterwards. You don't want to think, you know, if you're testing the same year they were born, I would really be concerned if it was a maternal antibody. Yeah. Uh, Dan Walsh, are you still on the call? You may have something to contribute to this. Thank you. Do you want to? I'm Francis. Go for it. Just to Dan can talk, but I, I just want to say that I'm going to talk about this in my presentation a little bit. So hang tight. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Anything? Go ahead. And call There's a question. chat question from Adam Grove from Montana <clears throat> FWP. Are chronic carriers an issue with other pneumonia causing agents besides Moby? Yeah, that's a big question. An issue for what? 
How does it? How well, does I, it, I guess you're, 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 you you assume that there's infection or? pneumonia caused by these other. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an assumption. Yeah. yeah. Nobody's wanting to take that one, Adam. Sorry, bud. <laughs> yeah, Adam, I think it's a it, it's a it's either a big question or a question that is part of an assumption that you make when you're tackling these problems. Anything else? Reminds us that it's different. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, you bet. Yeah. You bet. Okay. Let's go on to the next uh, presenter. Let's stop. Clay, shut that door if you have to. Fresh off a plane from Brussels, come on in here. So, yeah, okay, everybody. Attention up here, Kevin's talking. No, um, with I heard that, Helen. That's my good ear, that's my bad ear. No, um, as several speakers have talked about this animal side test, and so you know, I give credit to Kurt All on our staff, he knew Pete from Montana days. And so um, working dogs for conservation surfaced in our radar a couple of years ago, Kurt and others knew about them before, but um, the last couple of years, we've helped fund some work that uh, we think provides another real time, maybe diagnostic tool. And uh, so short of, I'm gonna let Pete tell you about working dogs for conservation, but we're tickled that he was able to bring three of his staff and three dogs, two dogs. But um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Pete Copalillo with the Working Dogs for Conservation is going to talk about their work to try and help us all understand this MOV puzzle and, and maybe there's some real-time detection help. So Pete, thank you for coming and bringing your staff. I will tell you all tomorrow night on stage, Thursday, Conservation Light, no speeches. We're going to have a dog trial in front of the whole audience. And we're going to expect the audience to be quiet, lights off. The cameras are going to be right up on stage filming the dogs. And with those big LED screens, everybody will be able to watch how these trials go. So, Pete, take it away with you and your staff. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of blast through this kind of quickly. And um, when I don't make sense, not if I don't make sense, but when I don't, feel free to stop me because the reason we're here is to is to get feedback and to to be here with all of you. And um, this is this is a look behind the curtain. This is work in progress. Um, like like many NGOs, nonprofits, we sort of build the airplane as we're flying it sometimes. And you're gonna you're gonna see that process right now. Um, and and uh, and hopefully you understand have a flavor for it's it, this is kind of complicated, but there's some promise here, and I'm really excited to to do something that's going to be useful um, for all of you. Um, and so I want to I want to go fast and and leave time for your feedback um, and and questions as well. Um, and I also want to say this is a proof of concept. You know this this really isn't peer reviewed science, um, but I'm, we're going to touch on that question when we get to the end. Um, about what you guys need in order to be able to act on this and do something with it. Um, so one person, oops, see there. One person who's not here is Amy Hurt. She's one of the founders of our organization. Um, she's a director of special projects. She is the technical lead on this on this project. Um, and um, but as as you'll see, this is a big one, and that's why um, Amanda Ott, Paige Smith. And Michelle Vasquez all came is to interact with all of you and to 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 um, to, to you know learn and, and to figure all of this stuff out uh, sort of together. And you know I'm I'm office boy. I, I chase money and direct traffic. Um, they did let me pick up sheep scat. That's like the first time I did done field work for this uh, for this project. Um, but you know um, they're, they're we're here all week too. So please interact with everybody. 
Before we jump in, I want to say thank you. I'm a public land hunter and I depend on agencies. So, um, and especially thank you for my dogs, the two pointers there. They're especially grateful to all of you um, for doing the work. My, I mostly hunt meat in little feathery packets these days instead of big furry ones. But um, anyway, um, so this, as, as Kevin said, this corral some conversations um, and, and I just want to give you the big picture here. There, there are three big parts to this. The first is, is can we do an animal side um, real-time screening with dogs? I'm sure lots of you have heard about cancer dogs and epilepsy and all sorts of medical applications that are happening with dogs. We collaborate with a lot of those people and these methods are pretty similar. So you kind of understand that. But one of the other questions is can, can, we, can we do this as, an, as a non-invasive way to monitor disease on the landscape. So I'll tell you a little bit about it, but you know, if, if we're working from SCAT, can we use SCAT that's that's you know been out for a while? And, and what is that gonna tell us? And how long will it last? And is it possible? Can we can we get the dogs to do it? And then I, I run a, I want to mention this one. This one's really Kurt's baby um, as well, which is which is uh, a very different um, you know this is this is a, a, a we use detection dogs, but it's actually a discrimination problem. Telling dogs are really good at detecting low levels of stuff, but they're also really good at telling the difference between two very similar odors. And so these are these first two are discrimination problems. This is a livestock guardian dog. This is a totally different deal. But the question is, can we use dogs? Can we apply dogs to maintain spatial separation? We've had a workshop. It led to some really interesting hypotheses and some next steps. Um, and, and we're going forward with that. But we just don't have time to get into that today. But um, you know, I, I'd love to bend your ear or hear what your perspectives on that um, over a over a beer tonight or sometime the rest of the week. Um, because you know, this is another you know what we can do about it, how we can go forward. Before you go, show the ram in the background there. Yeah, there's a ram back there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, in with the let's call right and the big light. Yeah, that's off the web. I I stole that off the web. Yeah. Okay, so, so I worked in Africa for 17 years, and when I was moving back to run the Yellowstone program for the Wildlife Conservation Society, I, a, a good friend of mine, who I'm, she, she's, a, she's a positive person, so I didn't put her name on there. But she's, I, she said, what do you want to work on? I said, sheep. And she said, don't go near sheep. <laughs> don't have anything to do with sheep. Work on the bison first. Um, but then in 2019, an op a, a cockeyed optimist said to me, it's worth doing. Let's go for it. Anybody have a guess who that Cockeyed optimist is. Yeah, it was Kurt. We were at a we were at a conservation storytelling event, and we just got to talking about it. And um, and he convinced me. He said, you know, this is um, this is worth doing. And so it, it took us a little while to get going. Um, but um, Kurt and and Wild Sheep Foundation, and then Kevin, and now many of you who I'm 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 now getting to meet for the first time, um, were willing to take a risk and say. Let's try this. And so thank you all for, for, for doing that. The earliest part of the collaboration started with Montana State University. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we got through that because it does have some relevance for what we know the dogs can do and how we might go forward um, in the future. Um, but you know, for now, that, that Wild Sheep Foundation and Montana State has led to a whole bunch of other jurisdictions and people who are, who are interested. Um, and who've been very generous with time, samples, perspectives, all sorts of, of stuff like that. Um, right now, uh, the leaderboard is, uh, I would say, is, is, is probably Peach, who uh, is the, the, the poop fairy who's given us the most uh, in terms of training samples. Oh, a new name. Not only for poop fairy. Not only for, not only for Amobi, but also for chronic waste yeah. disease, which is also, we're also working on. Followed closely by Todd in Nebraska is, has been amazing. I, I was teasing those oh, guys. Like, five. Great. Our, <laughs> our UPS delivery person is, thinks that this is pretty weird delivering boxes of sheep, sheep shit. But, um, but lots of other, uh, lots of other um, um, you know, folks, BC has been big too. And, and so we're working on those samples. So, you know, we, we're between the, the folks on this map who've either expressed interest or reached out or said, hey, just keep us posted. You know that's that's a lot. That's a lot of the the, the of, of sheep range. So um, again, we're hugely grateful because we can't do this without samples. Samples, training samples, right now are the rate limiting thing for this. 
Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you a little bit about why that is. Um, it's some of the peculiarities of the dogs and how they work, uh, but that's really the, the, the bottleneck for us right now. Um, so this work started, um, there was that little pandemic, you guys remember that? Um, and, and interestingly, while we were going off and chasing some money um, and figuring out how to do this, the pandemic hit, and the state of Montana had an innovation fund and to work on COVID. And so we decided to use MOV as, at, it was early days in the pandemic. Nobody knew how to handle it, what we were allowed to handle, any stuff like that. So we said, let's use MOV as a model for COVID. Can we detect a respiratory disease on discarded masks? So the idea was that, that frontline health care workers would discard their masks, a dog could screen those and then say, hey, this person needs a, a, a more, you know, a more rigorous, more whatever sort of test. So we did that. Um, did it with a whole bunch of sheep. Diane Binchak and the and the and the, uh, the folks at Montana State put lots of masks on lots of sheep. And you know, that was when it was all blowing up and being political and sheep and stuff like that. So we all got a lot of chuckles out of that. Um, I'll show you some of those data. But before I do that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about how we actually do this work, because it does have implications for how we interpret the data. There are some artifacts that live in here, and some of them come from this. This is a, called a scent wheel. This one has 12 um, ports on it, but this is how we present odor to the dogs. So, um, and this is not how they're going to do it tomorrow night, but it's a modified version of this. But the idea is you send the dog out, the dog walks around, it checks one, it checks two, it checks three and it will alert or do what we call a trained final response at, at, um, at one of the ports if it has the target odor in it. Um, this is Finn. Um, Finn is, is, one of the, um, is, is one of the MLB dogs. Um, I'll tell you a little more about her. But we do this in a, um, we do a dog blind. And the reason for that is so that we don't cue the dog. Many of you know the story of Clever Hans. If you don't, that's another one for beers tonight. Um, he was a horse who did math and he was, he was cute. Um, so Finn's in a room by herself. There's a remote camera, so we can watch from outside the room. Um, <clears throat> there is only one target odor in the whole set wheel. The other ports have distractor odors. Those distractors could be anything, cat food, a rubber glove, sample medium. It can also be negative sheep scat, MOV negative sheep scat. Um, so that we're, so that the dogs are learning, I only get paid if it's MOV positive, right? So um, it's it's in number two. Remember that. Let me see if we can run this here. Here goes Finn. Her command is is to go search, and now she's going to go and she'll alert. That's her alert. Trained final response. So she puts her nose on the target and stays with it. And then if you, we have the sound on, you hear a beep. That's a called a treat and train. It gives her a little food reward. Um, because she's doing this over and over again, most of our dogs are ball reward or toy rewards, but that's a food reward because it's a smaller level. Anyway, we do this over and over again. This is this is how um, the samples, if you know the cancer dogs and 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 the same method, same the way they do it at Penn Vet and all of that. Okay, so here are some of the data. I apologize, that red is a little bit hard to see. Um, we're, we're just talking about three parameters here, the, and then the usual three for, for disease. Sensitivity, how likely is it to tell you it's present if it is? Specificity, what's how likely is it to give you false positives to be wrong, right? If it um, or an accuracy is a combination of the two, right? And here's the calculation we use for accuracy. It's um, just true positives plus true negatives over both plus the misses, right? So it's just an overall measure. There are lots of them, everybody has their own. Um, ones that they like um, or don't, you know, they have their own um, uh, strengths and weaknesses, but that's that's um, the one we decided to go with for this. So um, in the beginning, I mentioned to you, they were successful with the, the masks and with um, with MOB positive dung, discriminating dung of domestic sheep. We started with domestic sheep. These were SPF sheep. These are, you know, born sort of clean and then infected with MOV, experimentally infected. So what was nice about those was we had, we could actually compare the same individual before and after infection and see whether we get alerts to them. And they did quite well. 
Um, these were some of the data Kevin presented. I think it was it a was it a this working group you presented to when he gave you some slides last year. Um, different one. Different. Anyway, so yeah. some of you may have seen some of these these data before. Um, and you know the the in general they were very high. We had one dog Zoe who's not here who had a really bad testing day um, that day, and we learned a little how they work. Um, but in general, you know, relatively high um, sensitivity, specificities, and and um, um, uh, accuracies. Now, those dogs, these dogs too, were trained just on uh, MO, MOV positive domestic sheep scats. We have just included in these data our MOV positive bighorn sheep scats, and they did relatively well transitioning from, from across the two species. They have not gone back and trained specifically on bighorn scat. That was a, just a test to see if they know it in domestics, can they do it in bighorn? And, and they had relatively um, relatively good, those data aggregated in with the dung here, and they, but they did quite well. So that's where we are right now. These guys are gonna go home and continue to train on those bighorn um, scats. I also wanna mention to you some of the other stuff we did from Bozeman Deaconess Hospital, we got, um, actually, it wasn't the nasal swabs themselves. They gave us the media, the buffer media that the swabs were in. And we trained dogs based on those, using those. It was a byproduct. It was discarded. They said it's safe for you to handle. It's fine um, for to expose the dogs to. Sensitivity was 100%. Um, and accuracy over 90. So they did, they did quite well just with the buffer medium. Um, and after the, the swab had been removed and sent off for, for PCR. So, um, so, so that's encouraging as well. I also want to tell you about culture. So um, Finn, the, the chocolate lab you saw in the, in the wheel room there, um, we trained Finn just on cultured MOV. And she got really good at it. Um, and um, and, and the, the negative for that or the distractor odor was Manheimia, and then it was the growth, um, the growth medium. And it was bare plates, and I don't remember what else. Um, and um, and she was she was quite good at that. However, then we asked her, we gave her positive, was it domestic or bighorn? Positive domestic sheep scat, and her sensitivity was zero. <laughs> so what what that's telling us is that. We, we wanted to do it on a, on a culture in order to ask whether maybe if we've got MOV, we train on bighorn scat. And one of the things the producers told us is, oh, you know, whitetails are spreading it around and other species are spreading it around. And it's, it's always, it's everywhere. It's no big deal. So what we wanted to know is if we've got a dog trained on it, will she alert to that from another species? The answer is no. The answer was no. If we're trained on the culture. So Clearly, and, and this is I, this is the uh, the messer told me so result because he, he told me no, it's not going to come through. You're not going to get it. And sure enough, we didn't at all because it's wimpy, I guess, for reasons you guys understand far better than I do. It doesn't pass through the gut well at all. So um, clearly, what they're recognizing is something other than the bug in the scat. Is that you know? And I, I'll I'll tell you just a little bit about that. But here are some of the um, the the sort of uh, the takeaways, and then, and then what some of these things mean in terms of where we're going methodologically and why and all of that stuff. Number one, you know, they did well, and they did well in a lot of different um, uh, sample types, from the medium to, to the breath sample um, to, to scat. Um, it seems that the, the top end, we're not done with the training for, for bighorn, but it seems that, you know, coming out the, the top is easier than what's coming out the, the, the backside. However, you know, scat's not as, as reliable. However, we want to do scat for reasons I'll discuss in a second. Um, the transition was, I would say, successful by training on domestic sheep. It gave them a foundation to do bighorn sheep. So there is, in, and, and that's with respect to scat. So there is some indication that across species, there is some, some common, you know, odor profile, some common denominator. They're going to continue training on, um, on Bighorn. We're done with the domestic stuff. We don't need to use it as a model anymore. So we're not going to keep working on it. Um, but 
there is, you know, if, if it turned up in another species, there is some hope that we might get an indication, change of behavior, something like that. And then the, the last one is the one I've already told you. The indication for SCAD is likely it's, it's indirect. It's not the bug itself. It's, it's something else. Um, maybe that's microbiome. Maybe it's some other change. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about so a few little avenues we're going to strings we're going to pull on to see if we can figure out what that is. Um, but but here's the reason we're sticking with the, the SCAT. Um, you know, one of the two applications, um, you know, that I mentioned to you earlier, obviously the animal side, it, it seems to me it's likely it's going to be a better approach to either use a swab or, or you know, gauze with, with you know, nasal secretions um, than it is for SCAT. However, there may be, maybe SCAT's all we can get at a capture. Maybe that's not, you know, maybe it's too dirty, maybe the washing, whatever. But if we want to do the landscape, when we don't have the option, we don't have the luxury of capturing animals, um, or maybe if we want to screen different parts of the landscape to decide where to do things like that, we want to stick with the, the SCAT, see how far we can make it um, with, with doing that. So those are some of the, those are the clean sort of end of the results. But what's really interesting, and these guys can tell you a lot um, more about it, is there's a lot of variation. Some of these populations that they're working on, they're, they're, they nail them. They're really, they, they just know immediately what's going on. And others, they're like, huh, this is a little different. This is, you know, and it may be just that, that we're asking, we're asking them to learn from a Nebraska animal and then to apply that to a BC animal. You know, that, that, there are different soil types, different diets, different stress, all sorts of different things. But this is one of the things that sort of keeps me up at night. This is a this is a relatively recent paper, and all of the all of those in the pie chart are different pathogens. You guys probably all know this. But what what makes me worried about this is are we training the dogs to detect an animal that's sick, just sick in any old way, right? Or are we detect, training them to detect sick with a respiratory infection, but maybe any respiratory infection, right? Or are we training them to detect MOB infected, but maybe not acutely ill, right? Or are, are, are we training them, you know, acutely ill, everything. So we have not teased that apart yet. And so this is gonna lead me to another request um, for, for you guys, is to know as much as we can about those samples. Right, and and also to get your feedback on on whether we want them to alert to all of those or just or, or only some of them. So as as we look ahead and go forward, one of the things we're going to do um, we're going to continue training. Um, I'm going to ask you all for swabs as well, so that we can train on on on, on swabs as well as as scat. We're gonna we're gonna use um, as much information as we can to figure out what. In what and how the odor profiles are different for these different um, um, sample types. So GCMS, um, you guys most you know PCR. There's a, a some a postdoc at, at MSU is going to work on microbiome analyses of the of the SCAS that we're looking on. And I just learned about this PTRMS yesterday. It's called protein proton transfer reaction mass spectrometry. It's a it, it's basically a descriptive tool that just tells you the weights of all the the, um, the, the molecules in there. And then you look at it and say, well, this has the same profile as that. And that may, by comparing either positive and negative um, samples or positive samples that they're really good at, positive samples that they have they struggle with, um, it may be able to tell us what are the components of that odor signature that, that, that they are keying in on that, that's useful. There aren't a lot of these machines in the country. Um, they're very expensive. And they're hard to, to, to get. So we'll see. It may take a while. Um, and then um, some of you have been um, generous enough to, to allow um, us and our staff and dogs to, to be present at capture events. One of the things that we need to do is make sure that, that including a dog fits into the, to the workflow, the workflow of a, of a capture event, so that you can have them there in real time, you know, and, and you know, it is a dog complementary to the little box on the, the you know, um, biome box on the table. You know, can, can you make it work? Can we can we do this? And we need to figure that out. And then we need to do the aging experiments. How long does that odor signature last? You know, out in, in the sun and the wind and, 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 and all of that. Um, and so if you get a positive alert from a dog, does that mean that that there was a 
MOB positive animal here within the last two weeks, or is it from a year ago? You know, we, that's a that's a really important um, thing to know. So, um, so so my my requests of you guys are keep the scat coming. We're so grateful for it. The reason we need lots of scat, um, well, and we're going to ask for, for for swabs and the information, everything we know about those individuals, because we just don't know what's what's driving, you know, a, a really you know uh, strong odor signature for, for for the dogs. But and here's why the the we need lots of of, of scats is that you know the dogs are dogs are not good at generalizing. We have to help them generalize. And in fact, most of what Amanda and Paige and, and Michelle do is to keep them very specific so we don't hit on non-targets. But, but in order to help them generalize, we need, to, um, we need to give them examples of all of those and reward them for all of those. One of the things that dogs do, they, they cheat. They like to get paid, <laughs> right? So we can't reuse training samples for testing. They have to be totally separate because the dogs will just memorize the individuals. They can tell an individual's odor just like they can tell their target odor, and they'll just remember, oh, that's the BC number seven or whatever, and I get paid for that. So we can't you, we can't do that. We toss them out after after every one. So we go through a lot of samples, and, um, and 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 we need to walk them through a lot of different examples. So that's why we're we're greedy in terms of wanting lots of samples. As we this is um, um, this is the the protocol from 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 this initiative um, for swabs. And whatever whatever um, methods you're using to collect them, that'll work for us. A dry swab or the medium will will work for a for a training sample and for a testing sample. So we're we're not we're not too picky about that at all. And there's the the bit of it. I just want to end with with one quick thing, which everybody knows. Everybody knows this. Everybody loves a dog story, right? We rescue the dogs that we train. Everybody loves that. Rags to riches, you know. The press comes out of the woodwork to, to see dogs. We work with folks. They say, "I've been working on this species for ten years. Nobody ever came to see me." And then a dog shows up and there's <laughs> Amber. <right? laughs> it, it's common. This is Michelle. Michelle was in USA Today. That's Suta calling last. There, this was the CWD and contaminants work on the Blackfeet Nation. That got picked up in in print and broadcast um, outlets in 21 different states. And not only not only big national ones, but local ones as well. This is this is a smattering of some of the, the you know um, uh, of the outlets that, that picked up some of our other work. And European news outlets. And European, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's it it is an opportunity for you guys to reach out, whether it's your legislators, your directors, you know, whoever needs to see or to get a message out, there's an opportunity to, to piggyback on, on the dogs, which is really great. They're also an opportunity to work with local communities, right? I mean, the, the, we have a, a bunch of producers in the room for the for the separation workshop. They love to talk about their big whites, you know, the dogs and keeping them separate. And it's a great icebreaker. People love to hear about it and it, and it works really well. So in Pete's fantasy world, you know, a year or two from now, you know, we're going to have dogs who are who are ready to go out and be at captures and give you give you feedback. How you use that feedback, it's another more on the you know, it depends sort of um, context is 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 up to you. If you want a dog there and just prioritize the samples, you say we're going to spend the money to do these samples or we're going to do these ones first. Great. If somebody's willing to make a decision based on a, a, a dog's alert, you know that that's I think that's valid as well. Um, I could envision people using the, 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 you know, screening the landscapes for where are we going to do our captures? Where should we get them from? We don't have the luxury of capturing animals first to test. You know, use that as a pre-screen, whatever. Um, and then, of course, you know, I think, you know, either Wild Sheep or lots of other organizations who want to minimize disease conflict, things like that, promoting the use of dogs. Um, you know, big whites. How to and and there are husbandry issues for the dogs too, because they're not easy. They're, these are these are can be difficult dogs, as Helen was sharing last night. Can be difficult dogs to keep, and so helping people get over that hump and do it and 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 do it well. So I, I'm we're here for your feedback and whatever it is. These are a few of the, of the questions. Um, I was I was grateful that Nate mentioned NGOs. You know, because we can go out and chase money and 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 you know. 
Um, what is the what is the quote? Vision without execution is just hallucination, right? <laughs> I'm an I'm a nonprofit. I don't have authority over anything. I can't manage wildlife. I can't do anything. We can have the best dogs in the world and and have 100. percent But if, if nobody wants to use them, who cares, right? So please give us your feedback and tell us um, what you think. We're here all week. These are all of our, our coordinates, and, and these guys know how to find us. Pete, can you take a minute to talk about Michelle's project coming up at SDSU? Sure. You want to do it? You want to talk about it? <laughs> Got about eight minutes. <laughs> okay. Pete, eight minutes. Okay. Michelle is one of our canine field specialists. She and Paige are, you know, they are the, um, they're probably up on podcasts and, and more than, than books on tape and anything because they put in the more windshield time than anybody because they drive dogs all over the country to do field work. Michelle's going to go off to graduate school and is, and is going to be involved in um, one of the first steps is to be at captures and, and compare dogs, biomeme, and, and bottle samples um, sent off and see what stories they, you know, how they differ with respect to each other. She's also going to do some evaluation of the dog process. You know, how fast can they do it? If we do get, you know, it's also an opportunity to add to the samples. If we do get positive biomeme, um, you know, results right there in the field, that's the freshest sample we've ever seen. We've never had a fresh sample right out of the back of a, of a sheet. So, you know, this is going to be an iterative process. Um, and she's going to be doing it for a while. And I, and I hope collaborating with, with all of you on that stuff. So that's it. Questions? Or feedback, feedback. Tell uh, me, I'm pulling it. Do I have a microphone? I, I don't know. Do I need one? I'm not going to ask. You're asking where it is. Wake up, Jordan. Um, one is one is an observation. I think you can raise money by recycling that poop and selling it for organic fertilizer. <laughs> Secondly, um, don't get two bad ideas. <laughs> observation: uh, When we had this flock of sheep that was on the video. Um, she, they're, they're a rare breed, so they, they were really heavily affected, probably a narrow gene pool, whatever. But she really recognized some changes in their skin, in their wool quality, et cetera. Could you be picking up some of those external smells from the skin? Probably, yeah. I, so, you know, I initially, with the, the GCMS and the, the microbiome analysis and everything, I was a skeptic early on. I said, I don't care how they're doing if they're good at it, I don't care what they're keying in on. I don't care what the odor signatures are. The other component with dogs is, you know, Leo is probably not doing it the same way that Stella is. And and by the way, you guys, we have eight dogs working on this project. I think that's more than we've ever put on any single project ever. We've been working on San Joaquin Kit Fox for over 20 years. We don't have eight dogs on, on San Joaquin Kit Fox. So that, that's a sign of our sort of level of commitment to this. But anyway, you know, the individual's doing it differently I think that really is a thing. I think they may be in on different things. It's just like, you know, you know, people, birders, some people are, it's all about color, some people it's shape, some people are auditory, right? So that may be a thing, but I think it will help us to disentangle some of those, those different um, parts of it and, and figure out what it is that they're doing. Sorry, I stole the mic. Anyone else? <laughs> um, I have two questions. Have you used or... Have you looked at any samples from strains that are not as pathogenic, say it's Alaska or somewhere else that has mobile urogata herds that we heard about that are chronically infected, but the herd seems to be doing well? I have no idea. We have no idea. We don't know anything about strains. We we just we get we know positive and negative from, from you guys. Um and, and that's I think I think we need to dig in to some of that. That's another thing. Or Michelle, I keep nudging her going, hey, there's another chapter for you. <laughs> She's got all four, four PhDs yeah. worth of stuff yeah. to do there. But one of them could be an analysis of exactly that. What was the clinical condition of that animal? What do we know about the strain? I mean, so much. You know, the deficiencies that we heard about, I didn't have a clue. I have another question. Go ahead, <laughs> when you started with looking at the mass sheep and trained dogs on those, were you then able to? I guess were those fecal samples from those animals also tested the dog? Yes. Yeah, they were. And in fact, we autoclaved the masks. That was part of it was because could we, in order to do that with human samples, um, and 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 yeah, they were they were paired, but only a very few of those because um, it wasn't easy for them to get the masks on the sheep and then collect. Yeah. 
you know, let's question be um last summer i think it was amy that sent like a half page or two-thirds of a page protocol on sample collections yeah. shipping labeling all that i sent it to mike i think he blasted it out to the working group i think and to the wildlife health committee but i noticed those two pages you had up there looked like a little more involved especially yeah. with the swap part of it is that information accessible on your guys website so that Somebody who may not know too much about this can go there and figure out the protocols, or does it have to be within sort of the work, Wild Sheep Working Group and the Wildlife Health Committee? I'll defer to you guys on how what you think is the best way to do that. I'll anybody can email us and, and I'll send them to you. Um, if you think it's a bad idea to put it out there for the whole world, then we won't do it. But we can I can get it up on our website if you want it. I'm happy for you guys to have it. I, I should say we're we're kind of our policy is open source. You know, we don't protect intellectual property. Anything we do, anybody else can replicate as, as they want. So don't let, and, and, and you know, Wild Sheep Foundation has been very generous. We've got individual donors who are very generous. So don't let the cost of world packs or, uh, you know, a technician's time or something be a barrier to getting involved in this. We can, we can help um, with that. Um, and, you know, um, any, you know, any, any, uh, anything we can do to make it easier for you guys to play ball, please let us know. Um, and, and we would love to do that. That pun, but at the top of their letterhead, and you see Michelle's jacket, she's got that logo on it. But, and there's a saying that I'm going to butcher, but it's like, you know, we're trying to save the world. They do it for the love of the ball. Yeah. It's such a cool letterhead. So. Anything else for Pete? Just an observation, Pete. If anybody has doubts, I got on the plane yesterday at DIA without taking my belt off, shoes off, computer out, or going through a digital way just because they had a dog on duty. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, they're good at it. They're good. So uh, for, for samples that are positive, yeah. So you have a sample and the dog um, finds it positive. And then you have you tested with several other dogs, same sample. And has that result been like a hundred percent, or has there been variation in the ability for them to detect that? We these data that I presented to you, they're pooled. Um, but but the way it works, the individual we run multiple individuals. The setup of that of the wheel system is it's kind of cumbersome, you know, because you set up. So what we'll do is we'll run one and then run run others, you know, with the same set of of samples. And I don't know, do you guys see that? Is it, do you see some consistency among them? A little bit. Sometimes, yes. Yeah, yeah, we try to use different pellets as well. So it's not like this dog has smelled this and the other dog has smelled that dog on it. So if we have a bag of 15 pellets, they'll each get two from that sample. So they're not smelling the same pellets, but they're smelling the, the same, same sample. sample. Does that so, make sense? Yeah. 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 And that, that's another one of those things. A student could go talk through all that data and look at Inter-dog variation, inter-sample, no, sorry. <laughs> I didn't even mean that, yeah. yeah. All right, thanks, Pete Thank and ladies. Guys. Innovative people doing things with the dog. And I would encourage you to look at Daryl's signature block on his email. His little personalized saying was, if there are no dogs in heaven, I want to go where they went. I want to go where dogs go. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so the next section gave you a little break from, you know, kind of the test case presentations. We did, you know, kind of the new work this morning, but we're gonna spend the next next hour and a half talking about um, some of the, the ongoing work where maybe we've learned a little bit more. And, well, I know you're all um, know Francis, but we're getting to know her really well today because she's up next to talk to us about Hell's Canyon. Maybe this time I'll figure out how to see. Doing good. That energy is such that it is. Hang on, let me, uh, before you start playing with that mouse. Should we all stand up? <laughs> Please do, if you want to. Can we wait? <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. We can invest. 
Yeah, I'm going to talk about um, Esther Rubin, Hell's Canyon, and I know I'm bold, some of you have heard about this before. And uh, this is an update. This is our recent capture, and this is an old capture with Brittany running by me. Little louder, Prince. Yeah. Dang, I thought it was the other thing now. Don't hear you. <laughs> All right. Um, Hell's Canyon is uh, on the Snake River in the states of Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And this area we've been working in uh, for decades. Uh, so we have a lot of data on it. Um, it's had a long history of pneumonia, pneumonia outbreaks. There are 17 approximately populations, and most of them are interconnected, but not, they're not all interconnected to each other. And over time, um, almost every population was affected by an outbreak in 1995 that started up in the north part of the population in Black, the Black Butte population. The sizes of the populations are three, or were three, that one's not there anymore, uh, to over 100. And um, the populations are very in range in accessibility from being very accessible up in the Soap Creek to being pretty inaccessible in Upper Hills Canyon and um, in the Halal Mountains. And the population has. Uh, had been stable to declining for uh, since 1995, and our objective was to increase it. And this is just a little bit more about that pneumonia outbreak in 1995. It started here. This is a picture of the different strains of MO that have been detected in Hell's Canyon. Blue is the 1995 outbreak strain. It, it started in Black Butte and then uh, spread to all these adjacent populations. And by um, 2006, the, in 10 years, it had been detected in 12 to 17 populations. And then in 2011, it was detected in this uh, Soton population that had been healthy up to that time. And that was kind of the impetus, among other things, for starting test removed because we'd seen what happened to all the other populations when they got infected and we thought we had a different way we might be able to manage it um, in these certain populations. So that's where we started our, our test and remove to try to avoid this long-term poor land survival that we've been seeing everywhere else. But that strain showed up. And so here's another little bit different version of that picture. Um, this is the Thornton population, Black Butte. And this was our uh, treatment and controls for that uh, test and remove experiment. Uh, the treatments here are green, so black butte, and then the controls are, and these are the, the state boundaries here, are uh, this Mountain View, Wanaha, Redbird, and Lower Hills Canyon. And then I'm also going to, after we talk about this, I'm going to talk about this other population, Lastin, that I talked about earlier today in the Wallow Mountains that we've been working on as treatment. So, uh, actually, this is not pre tested. Can you even see those colors at all? No, oh, they're very. That's like a bright red and black screen. <laughs> <laughs> they're mostly red, except the top line has a few black. Is there any way to fix that on the uh, screen, maybe? Hang on. What? Just point them out. Really want to screw with the controls? Yeah. Press the red. red. No. But that's even as easy. All red. OK, well, let go. Sure. All right. Very good. Perfect. Give him a little. Uh, <laughs> don't, let me let me give me the mouse. I'll be clear. So yeah, all of them here are red except for 
Is that you? No, no. <laughs> oh, so I was thinking about it. it. Yeah. Really good. She is going to wall with you. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So it. these are, this is the soda. It was healthy, black, not detected. Everything else in here is red. Just pretend to see red. It's a lot. Are you sure? I don't think I have control of the mouth anymore. Yeah. Anybody on Zoom want to do a lot of her supplies? <laughs> <laughs> We'll get, I'd get rid of that, really. Okay, and uh, during this period when the populations were infected, uh, this is our, um, uh, this is from 37 different uh, captures that we did over different populations in different years. The prevalence that people have been very interested in of MOB um, at each sampling. And if you look at the, there's a wide variability, but the median is uh, about 0.24 or 24 percent positive for uh, adults, um, about 41 percent for yearlings. Those aren't significantly different, but then lambs are about 75 percent positive. So. Uh, we conducted 485 captures of 410 sheep in these populations between 2012 and 2021, last year. And we detected MOV in 14% of the adults, 22 females and 8 males in the capture, in captures cap, conducted up to 2017. Um, we sampled animals that had uh, had a positive test at least twice over two years to identify the carriers, chronic carriers. And then while we were working on this in 2014, a new spillover occurred into the Blackview population. Actually, when we originally designed it, the Soton was the only treatment population. But then uh, when we had the new spillover, we had a pneumonia outbreak, and we felt they're so close together, we didn't really want that to Want to try to reduce the uh, likelihood of that strain spreading to a soton and to other populations. So that became somewhat of a treatment population as well. And uh, what we did was we, mo we removed like the carriers from a soton, which was the two tests. And then um, in Blackview, where we had the um, the pneumonia, the most effect of the pneumonia outbreak, we just did, we removed all the sheep there, which was eight. Two of those were positive and six were negative. So there was somewhat of a selective call and somewhat of what I would call a targeted call. Okay. Um, and so you might wonder, okay, I'm, so we removed five positive sheep. What happened to the other 25 um, that we detected MOV in? And 83% of those either cleared infection or died. So again, here's our, our um, treatment area with and controls with the names of the populations. And here's another great plot that's going to really be informative that you can't see. <laughs> It's a great graph. It's just the screen and lights. Can you sort of see like brown and black even? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this was where we said before was 2014. Everything was red. And then maybe these three, four, five. And then uh, 2014. And this is where we did test and remove. And since then, in the next eight years, we have not detected any MOV in our treatment populations. Surprise, the surprising thing was that when we went back to our control populations, so Mountain View, which you might recall here, is right between the Soton and Blackview and right next to Winaha. Um, the next year, um, in 2016, when we tested them, they had no MOV either. Um, and when, when I say we, we tested them, we tested them on PCR, and then we also tested lambs. Um, both PCR and serology. Well, we did serol PCR and serology on everybody. And uh, that year, we still had MOV in the Winaha population. 
our other controls, Lower Hell's Canyon, Redbird. And then in 2017, whoops. In two, in 2017, if you can see this, we uh, cleared MOB. MOB was never, has not been detected in Winala since 2017, still in Lower Hell's Canyon and Redbird. And then uh, by 2019, uh, we weren't detecting MOB in any of these populations. And we just did a capture in uh, this year, and we haven't detected any MOB. And we're planning to resample these as well this year. Yeah. So not only that, then in 2020, when we went, uh, when we sampled rest of the populations in Hell's Canyon. So this um, experiment was up here. Um, we had no MOB in these populations either. And I'm not attributing this to our test and remove, but um, we we have um, now no MOB in throughout Hell's Canyon, except for uh, down here, look at what you heard about this morning and in the lost steam, which I'll talk about in a minute. And I wasn't even going to show this serology slide, but now it came mm -hmm. up, so I'm glad I left it in. Um, in addition to that, like no MOB detected by DCR and, or, and no MOB detected by serology in animals born after, or no antibodies in animals born after um, the, uh, after we had last detected uh, by PCR. So to me, that means that lambs like their antibody doesn't even it must last months or it's a fairly short duration. Um, we also see up on this left side, these are all these are um, percent inhibition from animals that were exposed. And there's a lot of information in this slide, but I guess for the sake of time, I'll just say here this black line, these are all different herbs, but the black line is the is the average. And you can see here's detected and um, indeterminate. And by the first year, this is the years after exposure, so this is exposed, and then first year after exposure, most of the animals um, were below the, uh, were not detected. And then over time, that's gone down to, to um, you know, um, to all of the animals being not detected, except for a few, which do, which we heard about, like in the, the anecdotes that were told earlier, some animals do maintain it for years. Um, that will still be come up positive on the antibody test. And then this just is a cross section of cross sectional sample, and you can see that also the antibodies decline to being um, close to zero. And I think now we're probably almost at zero. But there are a few individuals that just keep testing positive. And then uh, this is the uh, slide of the responses of the population to clearance. So since we had we've been studying these animals for a long time, so good afternoon, give and finish this, Joe. Hey, Joe, mute your mic. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Okay, so before, um, this is probably the most um, indicative slide. There are four different parameter uh, population parameters. Uh, land survival to weaning, as we heard, is the where um, MOB usually has its most uh, causes the most effect. Most of the lambs die um, by September, weaning is about four months. And before we uh, did test and remove, we had about 38% survival of lambs to weaning. And after um, it went up to uh, about 75%. So um, it was um, over 100% increase. Um, and another interesting thing is that all the pop, these are actually, I should say, these are five population means. Um, and then this larger dot is the mean of the means. And all the means went up to about the same level. It was pretty interesting. So, um, and the 
variance was lower, was higher when the MOV was present than when it was absent, indicating that um, you know, we do see a lot of variance, I'm sorry, some good years and some bad years when MOV is present, and that's probably due at least either directly or indirectly due to MOV infection rather than something else, because we don't see that much variation when MOV is absent. Uh, this is recruitment. So obviously we had a lot more lambs uh, making it to four months of age. And so we had also higher recruitment. So but prior to when we had MOV present, recruitment was, I think, uh, it's about 0.26 was the average of uh, lambs per you. And then after um, was uh, about 0.45 lambs per you. We didn't see any differences in adult survival. And then population growth went from essentially stable, about zero, just about 0 0.1 per year, 0.1% per year to uh, about 12% per year. Except for this population here, which is a Zotin, that has not increased. So if we look at the population trend, this is a sodium, it's stayed stable, and other populations have doubled or more. These are the last detections of MLB. And we're, we don't really know why. Is it because of land survival? Obviously, land survival is really weak recruit. So it's got to be, we think it's um, either productivity is lower, we've had some issues there. And also, um, use survival for other non MOV reasons. And finally, the last team. Um, this seemed like it would be the easiest population to clear. It's the, the sheep are, um, they're pretty inaccessible in the summer, but in the winter, they come down to this winter range and they're got supplementally fed and they're pretty habituated, as you can see. They can um, capture almost every one of them. And, um, We've removed 14 positive views over four years, four different years, between 2013 and 2020. And in 2020, I was pretty sure we had cleared MOV from the views. And we had a year in 2021, we had a year of good lamb survival, but we also detected MOV in two rams in, in December of that year. And this year we have square lamb survival. So we're, we're focusing now, I don't know if Becky's still here, um, more on rams to see if, if that's the issue. Another concern I have is that they share a summer range with mountain goats. I'm not sure of the status of those goats, if they're possibly reservoirs. So I don't really know what's going on, but this is, that's the status there. So the conclusions are that um, we've shown that MOV can be cleared from big sheep populations by selectively removing carriers. And it seems that just as infection can spread among interconnection, interconnected populations, so can fade out. So perhaps some populations are serving as sources um, for reinfection when other populations um, sort of naturally clear MOV. And I think that's something that we really want to look into more because it, it's it was a really unexpected fighting and it has some potential. Um, implications for using test and remove on different populations, larger populations. Um, see that clearance of MOV is associated with significant increases in lamb survival and recruitment. And as we all know, in the real world, there are always unexpected outcomes. Some are good, like uh, seeing this fade out spread, and some are not good, like not being able to clear lost steam. And I think we can learn from these and use this Knowledge to inform management, we need to just keep persisting and trying to figure it out. Very good. Francis, thank you. Questions for Francis with Hell's Canyon? A lot of information, a lot of work being done there over a long time. So this is kind of the hallmark herd unit, I think, for test and remove that we have to draw from. How long did the test and remove go on for? I mean, you have 25 years of okay, so that's just paying like a hundred sheep, and it seems different. It's a pretty low number. I didn't get the last part, but that was just how long was the test in cold? 2013 to, to oh. 
five years. Six or six. Once you actually cranked it. And the removal, the, the initial testing was uh, two years that we removed, and then we just kept testing for the remainder of that time. Pretty cool to see those population trajectories doing this, right? <laughs> In the back. Yeah, I was just curious. I mean, how were you pretty confident that you were able to sample all the sheep in those different subpopulations? Uh, we sampled, I would say, 90% of the ewes. We didn't sample all of them. Even and in I should those say hard access areas, Francis? That northern Hills Canyon, where you said it was really hard access. Yeah, in Southern Hills Canyon was was pretty difficult, and we we did not uh, we didn't sample there. That those just cleared on their own, and those just those populations have declined to really low levels, and then they cleared it on their own. With the exception over here. Well, it was healthy when we started. <laughs> Francis, microphone right next to you, but for your control, for your control areas <laughs> in your figure that showed the increased recruitment and survival, were, were your control areas in there? Did they also increase or was yeah. that just your treatment area? Those ones that you saw the increase were our control areas. Um, those were just four populations where we have the best data. Um, all of our areas, though, the treatment, the Black Butte treatment area, and the um, the uh, four controls all have increased. Uh, it's just the Asotin that hasn't. So, yeah, I mean it's, it's very noticeable. So what do you attribute that to? Because we cleared, we cleared. So MOB cleared from all the populations. I probably didn't. I wasn't. I guess I wasn't clear. Right. So we cleared it from two populations, and then in subsequent years. It just faded out in our control populations as well. Hold on, Don. Don, hold on. Did, did we maintain that high testing rate in those control populations through that whole time period to know, right? Yes. I think that's important to it as we tested. We tested them and we did find that even after we cleared MOV from the treatment populations, they were still infected. And then over time, it faded out from those populations and it faded out the ones that were the closest to the treatment populations, cleared MOV soon first, and then it just sort of spread. That's why I say that fade out, just as infection can spread, fade out can start in one place. And then depending on the dynamics of how the MO, how those how MOV is being maintained, it can push the um balance so that that pathogen just goes extinct. Um, Mike, do we have a question on the web? Looks like uh, yes. How much of commingling was in the herds with treatment and the other group controllers? How much commingling? Amongst they're all interconnected. Yeah. They all have the same strain of MOV. So I wouldn't, you know, they're, they are distinct herds. But I think, as people know, like the Fraser River is probably a similar. There is movement of sheep between populations. It's not, I would say, it's at low levels, but it occurs. Sure. Go ahead. Um, back to the fade out. Does that mean in the, in the control herds there probably wasn't a chronic carrier present? Because it would seem, I mean, if you're a chronic carrier, you're a chronic carrier, it shouldn't make any difference if your neighbors are negative or not. But if if it was fading out in those populations, would that mean that they were maybe intermittently infected? Well, I think there's uh, there were chronic carriers in there. I think there are chronic carriers in all of those populations, but chronic carriers die and then they have to be replaced. And so well, wasn't it only like two years that Mm -hmm. that it faded out, but just it just seems coincidentally really fast. Yeah, maybe, and maybe, yeah, I don't know. We didn't detect any chronic carriers. You know, like I said, they 
um, when we went back and retested them, they were negative. So the ones that were tested positive. But I, at some point, I mean, we have, I'm sure they, I don't know. That's a good question. And um, I don't know how the dynamics work, but I do think that it, it you know, it showed a clear progression. And I think some of these populations are just sort of on the edge of clearing MOB. Um, and they just keep getting reinfected, you know, having enough movement of carriage carriers in there that they it doesn't happen. Okay. Or if it does happen, they, then they, they just, you know, they'll have a good year and then it starts all over again. Okay. Go ahead, Peach. Oh, wait a minute. Before you go, oh, what, the, what was her, what was that? Don't talk about it. <laughs> what is happening? Um, Francis. Oh, poop fairy. That's yeah. it. <laughs> Sorry, Peach. Sorry, Peach. Um, Francis, did you, did you, were y'all screening for any other, in your control and treatment populations, were you screening for any other respiratory bacteria and or just any other health status? you know, parameters like nutritional status, and if so, were there any correlations between, you know, the clearance or fade outs of MOBI and some of these treatments and controls and some of these other, like, overall, you know, health status parameters? Not consistently. We have a ton of data on it, but we've never found it very informative, so I've kind of stopped collecting it. Okay, one more question in the back. Uh, Francis, could could the could the Rams be playing uh, a role in part of this, like in Minnesota? You know, maybe maybe the carrier was was in one of the Ram groups. And, you know, those Rams are separated from the U's most of the year. I mean, is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you I mean, that's a good uh, suggestion because there is more movement of Rams in groups than U's. Okay, thank you, Francis. Okay, hey, next up, I think we have joining us via Zoom, Chad Lehman, um, to talk to us about Custer State Park in South Dakota. Yeah, so Chad was here. He had to fly back. Uh, he's on a plane as we speak, and he supposedly will be available for questions. But he videotaped his just like Jess did. So, uh, okay. well, is everything okay? Yeah. He, okay. he just had to get home. Oh, he good. had other commitments. Okay, good. But he loves us, okay. but you know, so yeah. premiere for him. <laughs> More for us. So yeah, Pete, okay. Pete, so, I'm pretty sure Pete's buying you premiere. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Hopefully, this will work, and including the audio. <laughs> We still have 90 people virtual. Yeah, good. 102 was the high number I saw. Good day, everyone. I am Chad Lehman, Senior Wildlife Biologist for South Dakota Department of Game, Fish, and Parks. And I'm going to present. Yeah. Let me uh, go back. I thought I did something like that. I am Chad Lehman, Senior Wildlife Biologist for South Dakota Department of Game, Fish, and Parks. And I'm going to present some information on test and remove for bighorn sheep in South Dakota. Good day, everyone. I am Chad Lehman. Hmm. Stuck on. Good day, everyone. I am Chad Lee. I'm going to present information from our three most recent case studies in the state, including Custer State Park, which experienced a die off in 2004, Rapid City, where a die off occurred in 2009, and finally Deadwood with a pneumonia die off in 2016. 
Research demonstrates that MOV, or mycoplasma over pneumonia, is more strongly associated with pneumonia than previously targeted pathogens. Plow Wright et al. 2017 found that about half of the bighorn sheep tested testing MOV positive consistently shed the pathogen, implying chronic carriage. We therefore hypothesize that pneumonia could be maintained in bighorn sheep by a, more, a minority of identifiable, chronically shedding or carrying individuals. Our strategy moving forward with herd recovery focused on marking and sampling sick herds and if possible, collecting samples from all or most of the individuals while creating MOV disease histories for each individual in the herd. We attempted to get at least two samples from each individual and we classified individuals as chronic carriers, consistently positive, intermittent carriers, negative and positive tests for that same individual or non-carriers, which were all negative tests. Waddle also categorized RT-PCR results into three MOV detection categories based on their psycho threshold value. Less than or equal to 36 would be a positive, 36 to 40 would be indeterminate, and then a test of 40 would be negative. first study I'm going to discuss is the Custer State Park case study. We tested the chronic carrier hypothesis in a wild population of bighorn sheep in Custer State Park in Rapid City. Custer State Park was our treatment population where we removed positive or indeterminate individuals and Rapid City was our control population where they stayed. Our primary objective was to determine if removal of carriers reduced pneumonia related mortality. This map illustrates the location of the two study areas, our Rapid City study area to the north and our Custer State Park study area to the south. And both of these study areas had similar habitats and similar predator communities. Capture and testing methods included VHF transmitters for adults and we used vaginal implant transmitters to aid in the capture of lambs. We collected blood from adults to detect previous exposure and also collected swabs for a MOVI sampling. We were successful in marking and testing 100% of the individuals in our treatment population and a majority of the sheep in our control population. We started testing for carriers in Custer State Park in 2014. And we attempted to get at least two tests on every adult alive in the population before or shortly after we started our experimental manipulation. We chemically immobilized and relocated all the chronic carriers from the treatment population to South Dakota State University. After removal of chronic carriers, no MOV was detected in 35 samples. We had 26 negative and nine indeterminate samples collected from 26 individuals or nine males and 17 females in the treatment population. Between January 1, 2016 and May 1, 2018, we collected 80 samples from 57 control population bighorn sheep. MOV was detected in 38 samples or 48%. Nine samples were indeterminate or 11%. And 32 were negative or 42%. We monitored survival of 86 radio collared adults. <coughs> For adult survival, we found a 94% annual survival rate in the treatment population and an 88% survival rate in the control population. Pneumonia caused less adult mortality in the treatment population than in the control herd. Also, predation caused significantly more deaths in the treatment population than in the control herd. We analyzed mortality data on 43 lambs. Chronic carrier removal had a negative effect on daily lamb hazard. This corresponds with a 77% annual survival rate in the treatment population and a 35% annual survival rate in the control population. Pneumonia caused mortality was significantly less likely in the treatment population than in the control population. Next, I'm going to present the Rapid City case study. At the start of this study, the Rapid City Bighorns herd had 22 ewes and 12 rams, and we ended with 13 ewes and 10 rams by the end of the study. 
The Rapid City Herd received a test and remove treatment from 2018 to 2020, and we used previous data from the Custer State Park study where Rapid City was the control herd as our pre-treatment comparison. We had nine MOV carriers, eight ewes and one ram, which were removed from the Rapid City herd, Rapid City herd, and four were classified as chronic carriers and five as intermittent carriers. Of the 66 nasal swabs that were tested for MOV PCR, we had 46 negatives, 11 positives, and nine indeterminates. Survival of adults pre-treatment was 73% and survival during treatment was 85%. Pneumonia-related mortality decreased in adults with a probability pre-treatment of 59% and a probability during treatment of 3%. For lab results for this study, we're going to break it up into two subherds. We've got the Spring Creek subherd and the Rapid Creek subherd. Carrier removal increased lamb survival to six months of age from 35% to 75% in the Spring Creek subherd and from 8.5% to just over 50% in the Rapid Creek subherd. The probability of a pneumonia related mortality decreased in lambs from 46% to just over 12%. Next, I'm going to discuss the Deadwood case study. This is an interesting study because this is our first attempt at trying to clean up a herd or with test and remove just with agency staff. We didn't have the full continuity of having a grad student and interns uh, helping with the testing and removal. So this was just our first attempt as an agency uh, to see what we could do uh, to try and help recovery of the Deadwood herd. So in this population, we had 24 sheep remaining uh, after the pneumonia die-off, uh, which occurred in 2016. And in 2020, uh, just looking at our lamb recruitment through lamb to you ratios, it looked like they were maybe rebounding. We were at 31% versus 6% in 2018. And then in the winter of 2020 and 21, uh, we got pretty aggressive and we tested 18 of 24 individuals um, that were in that population. So of those tests, then we had 17 PCR uh, tests uh, that were negative. However, we did have when you that tested indeterminate and it was left in that that population. Uh, we thought, well, maybe maybe we'll be OK and, and we'll just see what what lamb recruitment looks like next spring. And unfortunately, um, what we found was in the subsequent year, 2021-22, we found a dead lamb uh, that tested positive for MOV. It showed up actually in the yard of one of our landowners that, that really monitors this herd closely. And so we were right back at the drawing board. So then in the winter of 2021-22, we started testing again. And we did have the indeterminate U come back as indeterminate again. We removed that U, euthanized that U from the population. Um, that was in the early spring of 2022. And now we've been conducting fall winter counts uh, through 2022 here and into 2023. And it looks like lamb survival has rebounded. Our lamb to U ratios were 0.58. Uh, as of early January. So it appears we're in good shape. Uh, however, we are going to continue to monitor the lambs in this population and see, uh, hopefully next year, uh, we'll continue to see this, this rebound and recovery for this population. So in summary here, I'm going to wrap up what we found from our three case studies. And what we found was that pneumonia can be maintained in a free-ranging bighorn sheep population by perhaps uh, as few as two individuals carrying a MOVI or perhaps only one. We had one case study in Deadwood at a, where it looks like we had one indeterminate carrier that was maintaining this MOV pathogen in the population. So that was interesting comparing the three studies um, in how much one or two individuals 
uh, can really impact a population's health. We also found that adult survival was not influenced as much as lamb survival uh, following MOV carry removal. However, we did see significant reductions in adult mortality related to pneumonia, which I think is important um, to document as, as we know that you know lamb survival is probably going to be hugely impacted by this, but uh, we also did see some benefits in adult survival. As I mentioned uh, in our case studies, uh, lamb survival did significantly increase using test and remove in two of our case studies. Uh, it's a little more, uh, not quite as clear in the Deadwood case study, but hopefully we're gonna continue to monitor that population and see what happens. So I think one of the big questions that we always hear from, from managers and biologists is the question of whether or not to depopulate uh, versus just going in and, and testing uh, and removing uh, the animals that are carrying MOV. And one of the things that we found is there's a lot of population level knowledge in maintaining and having these use uh, in the populations. Things such as uh, knowing uh, where spring green is going to occur, knowing migration routes, and, and really what's really been important in our study areas is, is, is our resident use know where there's really good lambing areas to avoid predation. And I think one of the anecdotal observations that we, that we observed was when we were finished with the Custer State Park study and we were able to bring in uh, new animals, uh, we were able to bring in 12 collared ewes from the Badlands population to supplement the Custer State Park herd. And what we found was that initial year following the, the reintroduction, the 12 collared ewes from Badlands did not produce one lamb whereas our resident ewes in Custer State Park really had good lamb survival. So I think there is definitely some important knowledge there that these residents have that, that it's important to keep from a standpoint of, of lamb recruitment. The other big thing that I think people need to consider when you're doing test and remove is how accessible the animals are. In South Dakota, we have abundant road systems and we're able to get access to our sheep. We're able to ground dart a lot of sheep from trucks um, and, and able to test and mark a lot of in individuals. Also, the terrain in a lot of our country is easily accessible with helicopters. Uh, so we're able to, to mark and test most, if not all, of the individuals in each of our case studies. And so I think that consideration needs to uh, be there when you're thinking of designing a study in perhaps a wilderness area or something where you maybe don't have as good of access to animals. And so that's an important consideration as well. Well, that completes my presentation. Hopefully everybody was able to get quite a bit of information from this. And since this presentation was recorded, I will try and answer questions at a later time, but thank you for your time and attention. Good, thanks to Chad for dealing with that. Yeah, we, if, I don't know that we can answer them. And you might, you got um, Just a question, um, and I think looking at Todd, looking at Chad, um, Harry, Mike, it seemed like for about three or four years in a row, we were able to get the border open and we could get cattlemen bighorns. And I think the first batch went to Nebraska, the second batch might have gone to Nevada, the third batch I think started that Deadwood. Did you guys get some? Us and South Dakota. Okay. What I'm getting at is, you know, it, it didn't start with them, but then what? Well, well, well right, I, right, that was them. I mean, just that was different. back to back to back. Yep. And those catamaran sheep seem to be pretty virginal, you know, pretty naive. And it just seems like wherever they got turned out, they, they took a hit. You know, they, they might have gone okay or survived for a, lot, a little while, but then bang. 
North Dakota might have got some too. I can't yeah. remember, but yeah, yeah. So just an observation on picking your source herds. You know, of course you want to go with the healthiest ones, but something that's naive that way. Maybe you take something that's been a little exposed. Tom, you waving a question? Yeah, I'm just gonna add a comment after you're done. Yeah, there shouldn't be a microphone on that side. I'm coming. But, but certainly in the Nevada situation, we knew we knew that we were potentially putting them at risk with from mountain goats. And I think that in Nebraska there was all that I thought there were domestic as well. She's wondering, were there any, what was the domestic sheep contact in breath with Cadman? You know, we, we believe there was domestic sheep contact, you know, with those uh, Alberta sheep. Yeah, can't 100% confirm it, but fairly confident it was. And we tested all of them for MLBs by PCR and uh, serology, and they were all negative. Or, I mean, we knew they were negative when they left. Correct, they were negative when they left. So, yeah, they contracted it once they got back to Nebraska. It was about a two year period, I think, before we seen it hit. You know, they did quite well initially for two years. Um, but then after that alleged contact, you know, it went pretty abruptly then. So, we do still have some of those alive. Some have uh, lived through it and to have, and to have appeared to have cleared it, you know, what they had. So, um, and those are doing fairly well. It's still a small number, of course, but we have started to see uh, lamb survival increase with what few were left. But anyway, we lost a bunch right away, though. Go big red. Yeah, I think Mike had a comment, and then we'll get to you, Tom. But, I, but one of our primary purposes that we did in Nevada was we wanted to do an experiment to show everyone in this room and outside that mountain goats are part of this. And sure enough, we had infected mountain goats that are sympatric, and that is where our so big warrant sure. from so the Luxcar mine got removed. Tom, I just wanted to comment. That on. I don't know. What's that? Yeah, yeah you're on. Yeah, it's it's uh um. Yeah, what I just wanted to, you know, Chad brought up something I've been thinking about during this discussion, and that's the, the behavioral component of these populations. And I think different different populations have different levels of landscape complexity. And I think the more complex the landscape, particularly if there's migration involved, maintaining animals, the more animals you maintain in that population that have knowledge of that landscape. And, that's one thing we've learned is, I mean, sometimes I get the impression that we think we can just dump animals on the landscape over and over, you know, and I, sometimes we don't have a choice, but I think when we can maintain through this test and call as many animals that are familiar with that environment, and, and we also do need to think about using source populations that are adapted to that environment, potentially, but in my experience, when you put new animals into a landscape, new landscape, it can take 20 years or more than that, depending on how many animals you have in there and how complex the landscape is. Yeah. Yeah, you have your point. Yep. So we need to be thinking about, right, with the whiskey work. Hello? I, I think we also have to remember that when we're mixing populations, um, we're mixing organisms as well. And so bringing in those Alberta sheep was a great idea because they were healthy, but putting them somewhere where they're going to get exposed to stuff was not such a great idea. Yeah. Wow. So there. So that was one of, all, one, one of those other profound statements. And the other, the other thing is, do you know where those sheep and goats mixed and that transmission occurred. Yes. How? Because the biologist at the time has video of goats and, and sheep together. Were they were they like on a lick or something like that? Yeah. No. No, it's a summer range. Just hanging out together. They were they were circle lakes. Yeah. Around together. I mean from together. 
Running down. All right. Anything else we want to comment on? We've got a few minutes. Anything else running through your minds? Okay. One more. And we've heard a little bit about this. Chris, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, we're going to hear from Chris Proctor. Um, talk to us more about the Fraser River in British Columbia. Uh, can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes, and yes. yes. <laughs> okay, right on. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris Proctor. I'm a wildlife biologist with Fish and Wildlife Branch uh, based in Kamloops, British Columbia. Um, here today to provide an update on the test and remove treatments we've been doing on the Fraser River since 2020. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've learned uh, along the way. Uh, first, some background on the study area and the sheep population on along the Fraser River. Um, the map on the left shows the location of the Fraser River study area uh, in the central and southern portion of the province, west of Kamloops and west and southwest of Williams Lake. The map on the right is zoomed into that study area, showing the uh, different bands and treatment bands of sheep that we have in the area. Um, we've drawn those to roughly somewhat approximate discrete you or nursery groups of sheep to minimize um, uh, movement between bands as we as we get these sheep treated. Um, at this time we think that we're going to be doing this for about eight years so we try to draw treatment units that were somewhat discrete. Uh, I, I've never been there, but I imagine the Fraser River to be very similar to Hell's Canyon and the Snake River. Um, we have about 17 bands of sheep along the river itself, um, about 150 kilometers of river. Uh, sheep habitat in this area is mostly low elevation, rugged grassland uh, areas. Um, the sheep are largely non-migratory, but uh, we do have two migratory bands of sheep that migrate to Alpine Summer Range away from the river. We've, we've seen declines of about 70% in this population of sheep since the 90s, the mid 90s. And current estimates suggest there are about 800 sheep in the study area. Um, the sheep initially declined fairly rapidly um, by about 50%. Um, they've since largely continued to decline to current to the current day. Um, some bands of sheep have declined by more than ninety percent. Continue to decline now. Uh, other bands of sheep have partially recovered at different times over those years, but none have recovered to former numbers. At the time of those initial declines, we attributed. Um, the declines to respiratory disease associated with worm and pastorella. We now suspect that Movi was probably implicated in those declines um, and responsible for the poor performance and lack of recovery since. We suspect at least one reinfection event, um, possibly somewhere in the late 2000s, and we detected Movi for the first time officially in 2011 following that in a couple areas where we had particularly low lamb survival. Um, and that was detected in sick and dead lambs that we picked up. Uh, in more recent times, we initiated a herd health assessment in 2018 to understand the general health of these sheep, but also to inform the test and remove treatments that we knew we were going to be doing and the extent that they would be required across the entire study area. These are the results from that initial herd um, health assessments that we did. These are only the MOBI results. Um, 
In total, we captured 81 sheep by randomly capturing about 10% of any group, group of sheep we could locate in accordance with the Wild Sheep Working Group um, health sampling guidelines. Overall, we found about 10% were PCR positive and 20% were ELISA or sero positive. Um, we did not find evidence of MOVI in every group of sheep. And we attribute that to the low sampling rate, the 10%. Um, but based on the pattern um, and these results, we had to assume that uh, a carrier individual could be anywhere in any group of sheep across that entire area. So with that in mind, we set out to conduct test and remove treatments. Um, we estimated that, like I said, it was going to take us about eight years. Um, and we estimated that there were about 550 female sheep needed to be treated. Our approach uh, varied from the guidelines that Francis spoke about this morning uh, in that we captured and tested sheep only one time. Um, and again, as others mentioned this morning, this is primarily due to the cost, um, the time to do these treatments, and we were trying to balance the stress associated with multiple capture of these sheep. And we knew that we had about 550 sheep to capture and that uh, seemed like a big enough job on its own. Um, we targeted 100% of the females and I think we've generally hit that target um, with the exception of one treatment ban, which I will speak about later. Um, we did opportunistically include young rams that were in the U groups, um, but we did not go out of our way to capture them. If one was there, we captured and tested it. And at the end of the day, I think we, uh, we only tested a handful. Um, we mostly used BioMeme to analyze nasal swabs and make removal decisions. Um, we did take multiple swabs from all sheep captured and followed the BioMeme up res uh, results up with uh, results from a couple different labs. And PCR positive sheep were killed and necropsied, all others were released. <clears throat> we used a couple different approaches to the sampling and testing. Um, when we first started out, we uh, We'd set up a central processing site, um, captured sheep via net gunning, slung the sheep to the site, sedated sheep at the site, sampled and tested sheep on site, start positive sheep with a bolt gun. Um, due to COVID and other issues um, like poor access, um, we've since been capturing and sampling sheep in the field. Um, every sheep gets a radio collar. We are running the tests with the biomine later in the day, wherever we happen to be staying. And then we are returning to relocate PCR positive sheep and removing them uh, via gunshot from a helicopter. We've monitored these treatments in two ways. Um, first through pre and post treatment lamb counts uh, and counts in control areas which we defined as adjacent untreated areas to control for um, natural variation in lamb survival within any, in, within any given year. Um, we conducted these counts in November to ensure we were well past the normal MOBI related lamb mortality period and before winter when other factors may start to be important. Um, we have monitored these uh, lamb counts for a minimum of three years. Um, and I think that might change. Um, I think we're going to be in these areas uh, in future years that we probably will just keep up doing that anyways. The second uh, way we are monitoring these treatments is to capture about 25% of the surviving lambs in the year following the treatment to assess their level of exposure to MOVI, um, both through serology and PCR. So the treatments to date, um, we've captured 183 sheep in seven bands, which are highlighted in gray on the map. Um, we found PCR positive sheep in six of those seven bands, um, ELISA positive sheep in all seven bands. 
The one band that we did not find a PCR positive sheep is unfortunately the only band where we know we didn't catch all the females. Um, so we are currently, that just happened last winter. We are currently trying to decide what, what we're going to do there going forward. Um, overall, 19% of the sheep were PCR positive and we killed 35 sheep. At the band level, we saw pretty significant differences in PCR prevalence and a general pattern of increasing prevalence as we move north in the study area. Um, those are the PCR positive prevalence rates on the map <clears throat> and they range from four to 64%. Given our understanding of the infection history in this herd, we were pretty surprised by those high rates in the north end. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, zero positive prevalence rates averaged about 26% and ranged from 7 to 55%. The yellow is our upcoming treatment area and we will be working north on the other side of the river from there. Uh, so the results so far, um, the graphs on the right show lamb ratios or the number of lambs per hundred ewes in the different bands that we've treated so far. Uh, the pre-treatment pre counts are in gray, post-treatment in black, and control, if we had a control area, are in red. The results were pretty consistent across the six bands. We saw improved summer lamb survival in all treated areas so far, and where we have data, um, these results indicate that effect persisted over time. Um, on average, we saw 6.8 lambs per 100 ewes in pre-treatment counts, 44 in post-treatment counts, and nine in the control areas. With our second line of treatment monitoring, <clears throat> uh, all lambs captured to date in uh, post-treatment have been, have been PCR analyzed and negative, which indicates the treatments have been successful in removing carrier females so far. What have we learned? Um, we confirmed that removal of PCR positive females has promoted increased summer lamb survival in all areas where we've done the treatments. Um, the one strike approach is obviously quicker, uh, more cost effective, but the trade off uh, that needs to be considered is that more sheep may be killed than required. And that is probably um, particularly true for newer infections. We observed significant variation in the PCR positive prevalence, um, which suggests we don't understand the infection history and pattern in this herd and or whether other factors other than time since infection are correlated with prevalence. Um, we've only seen one strain of Movi to date in our Movi detections. And unfortunately, we do not have um, strain type information um, going back in time. Um, to help shed light on the infection history. <clears throat> For us, it was easier on the sheep and more cost effective to do the in-field sampling as opposed to establishing a processing site. This might change for others, particularly if access is better, um, but that's, that's what we found. Um, we've learned a ton about using and applying the biomeme and Helen, uh, can fill us in on that. So we had a principle that uh, one person did all the biome work, and I think that was super important. Uh, one, uh, I, I'm just going to read her lessons learned because she she learned a tremendous amount, um, and kudos for her for stepping up. Number one, temperature was super important. Um, doing biomeme in a field tent is ridiculous. Uh, so we we learned that both from biomeme and both and from our own experience. So having everything at room temperature, the supplies as well as the machines is super important. Um, we have switched to a lovely little office uh, that a. Uh, that we've had in, in two different cabins and uh, that works pretty well. 
Uh, sample preparation needs to be done in a meticulous fashion to ensure effective DNA extraction and to prevent cross-contamination between samples. Uh, unique animal IDs must be maintained throughout the duration of the project. Animals can be recaptured over different TNR sessions. So those IDs are critical. We need to follow those animals and all of their samples. Unique animal IDs are also used to label both the physical samples as well as the digital PCR data so that the correct results are tied back to the correct animal. And that's come in handy when we've had some really confusing reports from some of the, the lab-based um, RT-PCRs. Uh, going back to those animals, make sure that our results um, do correspond to the labs. Um, when we have the results, we re review the examples, and those of you that have done biome might understand this better than those that haven't, but you get three different graphs. You get uh, CQ values, you get RFU values, and you get a, a you have to look at all of them um, for both positive, negative, and indeterminate or suspect samples, um, and you have to look at those uh, before you collect the animal. Interpretation of those data graphs and values is challenging, especially if you're a newbie, and especially if the sample is contaminated with another sample, dirt or blood. Um, sometimes you do rub the inside of their noses and you get bleeding, so you've got to be prepared for that. If there is still DNA extraction fluid present in the sample, that can be a problem, and if the sample is not mixed adequately during processing. Uh, Sherry, Kylie, and I developed a standard operating procedure, and I think this has been handed out through the working group or the initiative, and that is all covered in here and gives kind of step-by-step -step, um, lessons learned that we've had with Biome. I think by and large, Chris, um, I don't know if you want to comment about Biome, but we're feeling fairly faithful to them. Um, that. Uh, <laughs> I cannot hear anybody. Okay, are, are we done with the presentation? Is Chris done? Uh, yeah, just one more slide there, folks. Um, we had a ton of supporters, a uh, ton of partners, too many lists here, but I uh, did want to acknowledge all the funding sources um, that's making this happen. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you, Chris. Questions for Chris, Helen, or Kylie? Somebody has the mic. Somebody can. All right. Two two questions. The first one um, is what were, I guess, if you compare the lab gold standard um, to the biomeme, what was the rate or number of false positives or negatives that you had with the biomeme? Um, or you said confusing results. Was that something where you had a negative in the lab, positive in the lab pathology? Okay, so I mean, maybe more sensitive in some cases, um, I guess. And then the, the other one was just you talked about the blood and the dirt, um, and if you guys changed anything about the from the basic extraction method on biomine, because I think that's what we're running into a lot is just not having good 
DNA yield even through controls. Yeah, so we initially did the first year have a couple of false positives. Well, I wasn't there. Helen can let you speak a bit more to that. It was kind of lessons learned in, in reading and interpreting those results. Um, and the biomeme technical support, I think, was quite helpful with that in the end. Um, in terms of what we changed with for dirty noses, so initially we were putting the swab directly from the sheep. We were taking three swabs and trying to always test them in the same order. So swab one was going to biomeme two to HC and three to water or whatever that was. Um, but we were putting the swab directly from the sheep into that test cartridge that came with the biomeme kit. Um, and we were having problems with viscosity and, and getting that sample through all the wells. So after discussion with Biomeme and the other labs, we've added a wash step. So we now put the swab into a buffer media, that little Biomeme supplies, these little tubes that have the media already in them and a little agitator and, and a filter, that's right, filtered separately. And so now we use that media in the test cartridge instead of the swab itself. And the other benefit of that is that we can now use that media as a additional sample that the labs can test as well from the same swab. Yeah. We haven't done that yet. Coming. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Honestly, okay. I think our false positives were all associated with our, our uh, naivete and bad temperatures and dirty conditions. And I think we we solved that after the first year. So it seems like in 2021, and then get to you, Allie, that we had in the in that workshop in June of 21, biomine was not really highly regarded. That seems to have changed in your estimation. Now. Um, honestly, like I say, I think we're really feeling quite faithful to them. Okay. And and the, it's so much easier to trust something in your hands than sending it away to a lab and not knowing what's happening there, mm -hmm. including, you know, did they mislabel something and et cetera. And, and I know they're the gold standard and I'm just a stupid old vet, but I really like looking at that little green line going, doing a little exponential S curve. It's, it's pretty cool. Okay. And, and, Thank you. So I, I haven't crunched all the numbers on this, but just from looking at it, I don't think there's much difference in the pause the I say this, the difference in results between biomeme and one lab and one lab and another lab. So I think that makes sense. And part of the difference that we no noted in the first year was the different CT values that labs were using as a cutoff and what we could read from biomeme. And, and I have to admit, I think these labs have learned something along the way as well, because they haven't been doing it as long as Waddle. And they have been now forced because of all the sampling, wild sheep in Western North America, not to mention the cost of sheep, to really, they can prove some of their things too, which is maybe a significant. Large of a population, you guys talked about like 17 different bands. How each of those sheep lining was kind of multi offered. How did you decide which bands to do? That's our brain in cameras that makes those decisions. Chris, do you, are you still on? Can you hear us? Yeah, I, I didn't actually quite catch all of that one though. Try again, Alex. Sorry about that. I just asked in this large of a population, I'm curious how connected all the different bands of sheep are. And when you're designing this effort in such a large population, how did you decide which bands to do first or which bands to do together, et cetera? Yeah, great question. Um, well, like I said, um, so before, when we did the first initial herd health sampling, we did radio collar about 60 sheep. Um, we used that data to try and try and draw those treatment units that would, as best as we could tell anyways, would encompass like discrete groups of sheep. But like I said, they probably are more connected than we think. Um, and I don't know if you'd ever get away with, um, I mean, sooner or later, you're gonna see a sheep move a long ways, right? So. 
they're all connected by RAMs, or most of them are for sure. Um, but we think that those treatment bands that we identified minimize movements of females between groups, but it probably happens more than we think. Uh, in terms of where we started, we uh, we actually started with with a band, probably one of the bigger nursery groups um, along the river that where we had like three years straight of pretty much zero lamb survival. So we started there. And then after following that, we just started on, in one end and worked our way to the other end. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Oh, go ahead, Mike. So with all of us in the room, how many are still using the biome? And how many are wanting to start using it? Yeah, uh, we in Texas, we just bought a, couple, a pair of the units and we're fixing it. Our first trial will be next month. How much are they for long? Um, well, uh, Jesus. They're pretty, pretty expensive. Phone number for, yeah. Seven grand. Um, the one we just bought, your cake was, was it? I was thinking it was like 11. One we bought at home. They pocketed. Ours was 4,000. Yeah, not, I think the ones you all paid for us, uh, Kevin, I think they were like 12 or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, a unit, a unit is 7K. Uh, an expensive piece of this is, are the go strips. So the go strips, they only produce those in lots. And the lot itself costs 11.5 for a set of 350, I think it is. And so when you do the calculation for the extraction kit, the homogenization kit, the go strip, it's $32 per sample, including some positives and negatives that you should run as you run your samples. About 32 bucks a piece. That doesn't count the unit and any other startup costs. And that okay. those kids expire? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and Biomeme has split lots as well. They're, they're pretty good at that. So you don't have to spend eleven five to get started. You could share with your partner in the next state. Yeah, you, yeah but they ask that they produce them as steps. Yeah. That's my and point. then you split them up. That's like forty thousand Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> my your point well, is the point is is that if there is a lot of these ghost strip um packet, you know, packets that are being purchased. It would make sense that more of us should contribute. Benefit, and maybe we can help be a part that. of it. Share. Yeah. Are you saying ghost? No, no, go. Go. One, two, three, go. Like so this is me being dead up, Francis. Go strip. Go. If you say it fast, it sounds like a ghost strip. <laughs> Ghosting. Yeah. Okay. Anything else for Chris, Helen, or Kylie? All right. We're almost done for the day. If Here's anybody coming. wants a copy of this SOP, Mike should have a, a heart. So I was going to ask you about that. Helen, is it not? And I wonder if it should be maybe appended to the guidelines. We can easily do that, I think, yeah. if it's appropriate. All right. Last section. So we've labeled other considerations. So just a couple of topics here. The first one being considerations for testing and removing rams, Mike? So, so I'm not here to present, I'm here to begin a discussion, but I'll, I'll set the stage, the table. A lot of us have heard uh, today about various projects, that are not really paying attention to RAMs and others that maybe have figured out they probably should after a year or two. Uh, so I look at several factors that are going to need us uh, to think about. You got spatial, temporal uh, activity of those RAMs in relation to use and nursery groups. Um, especially with, with the whole annual cycle of, 
of habitat use and uh, the rut behavior and separation normally of nursery groups and rams, a landscape connectivity of within suburbs and in neighboring herds. We've heard a lot of rams going on walkabouts where some of us have felt we should, probably should have been more aggressive with removal or at least testing and removing before we share and spread a uh, Maryland strain. Um, resource availability. So for us in the desert, um, many, most of our desert bearing herds, the, the rams are using the same water source as the nursery groups are during the heat of the summer. So um, not necessarily the same for California and, and Rocky Mountain Big Horn. Time out, Mike. I just saw um, a message that said they couldn't hear clearly. You might just verify if tumors are, less, are able to hear. Okay, Rebecca can hear. We can hear you. Loud voice. Yeah, I figured. Um, <laughs> so, so really, I, I think um, based on the initial work in House Canada, um, it made sense to me Francis, that if you have limited resources. We know that uh, transmission is happening in the nursery groups and we focus on tumors. So, but I, I do feel that we just all have to have our eyes wide open, paying attention, having knowledge of that whole area. Kind of asking for a thought on there, people that, that had the change in. Mine as they went through the test room. Probably put Matt Jeffers on the spot just to kind of share the thought process that went through over the years with and in the reality of testing and sampling. Yeah, I think it's just a little bit
Chris was talking about just just um, Google's firm guesses connectivity, especially on the Apple Tags. A fair number of brands in the Zoom's sure. Showing us clearly that they think they need it. So it made sense. I was just going to say, regardless of our two years in nursery groups, and the other issue that's not made them to happen in this group is that we had a couple of years of good land recruitment. Using naive users in the population, they get infected during the rut, and then some portion of those new users become new chronic shedders that then infect that land crop. So I think, and that may be, you know, I don't know whether they're interacting. You know, because water sources, and that's been one of our theories, but there's also just the theory that, you, you know, you might get some years of good land recruitment by just removing the use, but then you always have that possibility that, you know, a young you, um, so you just get it. I was going to say something that seems like this might is perfect. Yours might be working, so I want to try to. All right, so anyone, can you chime in and chat? This is Mike speaking. Can you hear me now? Is it better? Still could have been the microphone. No logic. So in our so we started a test and remove in large complex desert. We're pretty committed from the beginning, knowing that. So, um, I'm hearing two, I guess, two sides. One is focus on the renewables, and in your opinion, what would be the next what percentage would you say if you're arguing for renewables? Well, I, I think you need that make that assessment of those factors I talked about resource availability, temporal, spatial timing, about annual cycle activity of the animals. And if you think you have a fair amount of animals who's sharing the same areas, it's, 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 a, it's a tiny little spring source. You have a very close Um, very close contact, and I think I would commit right off the bat in in testing my use.
It's almost like a cup. Sounds like we still have audio issues with our virtual premises. Well, what if we we all get on the owl? Behavioral stuff. You know, it's dead more. Yeah, we never they were. We really did not find Rams attending those lifts, like you had said, um, the same thing as you did. So, you know, I don't want to say that attendance at a lift at the same time is a risk, but it might be good about less likely in this in our analysis of the government. Seems to me that if if we're worried that lonely millennials can pick up infection from the message of other wild sheep fans and bring them back, why do we ever really want to be a positive animal almost ever? I mean, I understand that it's probably better that if you test positive when they're four, kill them, then wait until they're eight, and then kill them unless you have a hunt, a management hunt, folks. But I would think that if you're going to try to get rid of it off the out of your population, you got to move your lands too, because you're still leaving a shedding animal in that group. I mean, it, and it may work differently for different. Uh, birds, but to me, it makes sense to get rid of it all. Puts you on the spot, Francis. And I think all of us are have a little question that do you feel the reason that you were um, not focused on Francis is to keep eventually? Never really heard of it. once you get it. Does happen? My God, in the situation, me, you know, first year. Yeah. 
I mean, I think there's something going on there that I don't like. Yeah. Some risk, you have to make a judgment call. Yeah, I'm and we're having these talks with Peter and Helen. We want to be adaptive, we wanted to be nimble, wanted to learn from our partners, our colleagues, and we wanted people to tweak you know, the basic premise of the test we move, see if we could uh, strengthen uh, sides of it that were a little unknown or uncover things that as guesses. Go in there with this being in the airport for the boss. So the snowstorms. Take home, and, and I know Nate would chime in. Is don't, don't forget to look data. If you don't look, we're never going to know for certain. It's it's just an anomaly. So that, that's my ask. Continue. To well, we're starting to look. Or kind of, so the more other people's data and kind of the role of that in the dynamics of chronic shedding and source and all of that. There's a lot more questions than answers. So I'm just encouraged, yeah, people to look and to you know, compare with your MLB results and the record stuff. Yeah, and right. Anything else to Mike? Because we're rounding third base and headed home. You want to get home? Okay. So we're going to end the day with Kate once again talking to us a little bit about some thoughts she has about genetics, bottlenecks, and issues related with test and remove. So, okay. Oh, Mike's dialing up our PowerPoint deck. This is I'm pinch hitting from the baseball yes. analogies. I'm pinching for contacts. Well deserves that help. Oh, yes. I actually was on. I love it. Pretty guys, what happened? <laughs> okay. Um,
Okay. Push through. All right, so we're going to talk about long term access. Um, this is meant to go with uh, a few examples or just now uh, a, a collaboration. So just sort of floating some ideas out there of things that we've been thinking about, we've all been thinking about. Maybe we're thinking about it in different ways. So maybe we need discussion for something. Or maybe you are so tired that it's testing. Okay, so what is testing for number five? Uh seems appropriate when infection rates are low. Most of our results are exposed when they're covered. Um, we talked about this earlier today, this idea that improving animals early on, uh, first contact on easier injury, it's maybe not the best idea. Um, this example, Mohanea outbreak in California, 2013-14, some populations had infection rates of 60% during the first wave of that outbreak. So maybe not as much as 60%. Maybe not. Um, a lot of those animals were covered and didn't become, would not become chronic carriers. So, removing animals that just wants to. Mm -hmm. So, the idea that we wanted to highlight is a lot about is this idea of So, repeated removal specific. Genotypes, so ones that have specific genes associated with infection, which could result in loss of genes. An immune system of other genes that turn out to be important for something else. And that's the issue. Um, and those variants noted they are still around. So in okay, the short term, it's probably not a big deal. And that's why we're talking about long term consequences. Short term is probably not a big deal, but what out of the long term, longer term? And we know that a lot of our populations are small, genetic drift is high, so the loss of genetic diversity is a worry. That's kind of a long term consequence. So an example of uh, bovine tuberculosis, we're introduced to this early in the day. Um, so resistance to tuberculosis goes heroin associated with genetic variation. Um, and South African managers call buffalo during some parents. Slide. There was resistance, so some of those buffalo were resistant to infection. These buffalo had lower survival if infected with vaccine had reduced production, so they were responsible for this. These buffalo were less likely to fall. These buffalo also had an immune phenotype that was associated with minor mortality infected with minor parasites. On the other hand, so that's resistant. Tolerance, all our buffalo were what we call proliferation resistant uh, to these. So they were getting get quite as sick, so they were tolerant of the infection. They did not suffer higher mortality from the infection. But they were more likely to be called because they got disease more easily. So they got rid of the ones. So that's a good example of thinking about are we thinking about are we removing something that's not going to be used for the genes? So, you might remove the taller animals that are not resistant to the most mass not always beneficial to the population model or herd model. Most wildlife are infected with multiple pathogens or parasites, and so they need a variety of ways to deal with these threats. The ways that they deal with these threats are connected to their health, just like the next. Okay. Next steps what makes a chronic carrier a chronic carrier? What can 
And the idea is that it gives me a good like an opportunity to evaluate human types, human types or human types associated with population. So for example, all right, some people are in the topics of various models. So the NHC is a complex complex issues associated with ongoing testing operations might be best additional statistics. So um but the things we have started following this is happening right now. Probably if I said who has a person. But we're, we're thinking that this is a good idea to keep on doing this whole blood and EPA or copy code uh, in frozen organization. You can sort of hear Clint's voice in this. This is a big interest of his. Plasma or serum to investigate the new foods that treats the girl. And so we would like to develop proposals for use of these samples. And that's kind of the end of the example of long term consideration. Slide. Super. Um, this is less well um, structured as a things. I think a lot of this we've already talked about. I mentioned So, especially this is a step aside. What's the initial motivation? What are the short term goals? Goals. Short term goals can be clearing chronic areas and on that. That's that would be great. Uh, maybe it's reduced, just reducing the number of chronic carriers and hope that we have a few improves and the answer to the town as the rest. What's the long term goal? It's tough, right? And it will be pretty great. Yeah. Yeah, it might be the goal. <laughs> I, I think it's uh, <laughs> that's, that's all we have. Sorry, long term considerations. Um, this sort of put together and drew together of some of the things that it was hearing during earlier today uh it's kind of sheep goals or things again some work on MS development would be welcome it sounds like Understanding so many folks have answered questions about well, the patients. I think that one way to think about that is these different things that are the risk of violence, history of the herd, all of these and other elements of the context of a particular herd population is going to shape testing. And then another theme that came up is this idea of stakeholder perception.
Still going to ask. Um, so, in terms of shadows, um, would you consider those intermediate shadows? I mean, I think all of us, I realize that we're trying to reduce these chronic carriers on the landscape. We're not capturing the person. It's not as So I think the end game of the process is our It's suffers. Just consider one structure. I just want to go back here. Yeah. 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 Tolerant resistance example was just an example. I don't think that you saying that we don't want tolerant resistance in our office. The lambs are not tolerant. No, they're not. No, so we won't have any lambs. You know, like they, they could be tolerant to other things, which is fine. But so I think I just think well, no, that's just going to be. Yeah, and and this discussion about do we want to hurt them? That's not the question. So just think that they might have. Help me look at question dish comment ish. So I guess in my mind, it's hard for me to be too concerned about removing the genetics of chronic carriers because they're doing it themselves, right? They're not these plants to survive. So they're kind of cutting off their own genetic contribution to the population anyway. And everybody else's by killing everybody else's lives. So I don't see it as like this. Well, big, there you got it. <laughs> yeah. So in my mind, it's hard to be too worried about thinking for those examples. If they weren't chronic, truly chronic carriers. Okay. Harry? I'm just making a we positive comment. And that is if your freezers are full, they're all the ones that are full, and maybe you don't have Perhaps wants all these samples. Don't forget that Texas is a downtown lot of Texas has a bio bank that is secure and set up. It's all and curated, it's all in uh, nitrogen, and they've got no one's going to go in and dabble in your samples without knowing it. It will be there in perpetuity, and it is free for anyone that has wild sheep. Set up by Clay Brewer. Captain and the Wild Sheep Foundation. So when everyone's when you say I don't have any peas, peas that's not going to cut it anymore. <laughs> Especially like that. Is there anything on the budget? Is this still an obvious issue? How many days are you Highly done.
they do have a show. All right, anything else? Okay. Well, just to add on Holly's, so maybe I misunderstood the Bobrite paper, but if there's lower heterozygosity in MHC in the chronic carriers, are you removing genotype sig one around less? Is there and you want more heterozygosity? Unless I took them some again, but not very good understanding the terms. <laughs> What you're saying is making sense. We recall that that was like one locus. And offhand, I don't know what that one locus codes for, too. So there's that. Okay, here in the back. <laughs> right. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a fan in understanding the genetics of our population. And that's a big focus of our management is moving animals for. Maintenance of genetic diversity, stemming from the work we funded back in the early 2000s. Um, but I think we also need to be careful about trying to manage at a resolution where we potentially can't manage, given how our wild populations operate on the landscape. I just don't know that we can effectively manage or develop the testing routines and all this other stuff but that find a resolution from a, a wildlife management standpoint on our landscape. So we have to think about it from that perspective, whether it's really uh, something we can use out there on our landscape. When we're trying to figure out what we want to do as far as moving things around, if we want to send Californians back up to BC, um, you know, we potentially don't even have the capability to to do what we want to do on the real landscape from you know, from the standpoint. So we have to keep that in our consideration as well. Okay, thank you, Don. Starting to wonder why we ended the day on genetics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, mate. I'm not sure I understand it either. Anything else? Anything else before we hand the mic off to Mr. Hurley to wrap us up for the day? <laughs> My old boss for a while came and fish, he had a saying, he goes, I don't understand all that I know about that subject. <laughs> Probably pretty accurate here for today. Um, before I forget, one last begging plea if anybody wants to chip in for lunch. Uh, appreciate that. Just some notes that I wrote, and this is not going to be anything profound. And I show straight up four o'clock, so we're doing great on time. We will get out of here ahead of schedule, get you on the bus back. But, you know, just an excellent set of presentations today. I saw 102 was the high number I participants on Zoom 51 a minute ago. So 65 people in the room and plus online pretty damn good so um, thanks to all the presenters for putting their information together it's certainly a lot to absorb and process um these aren't in any particular order they're just things i jotted down but you know it's really critical in my mind any bump in lamb production lamb survival is it ephemeral or is it durable i do think longer term monitoring is essential to evaluate the success. You know, if you get that one year bump and then like Francis showed, it's like, yeah, then it's tanked again. So I think that's a pretty healthy metric to keep track of. Um, based on yesterday's conversation during the Wild Sheep Initiative meeting, I would have guessed, Daryl, is there going to be a short written summary of this day for the Wafka leadership? You know, Zach and, and Brian Neswick, the Norton sponsor, and then ultimately the rest. But I would guess there will be kind of a next step. There will be some sort of written summary for that. Um, clearly, we learned a lot, but also clearly there's a lot we don't know. Um, repeatedly, people said it's a long term venture, not a quick fix. So be patient, be persistent. Um, 
we're still struggling with some of the diagnostic accuracies. Um, work continues on that. One thing I put two stars by, I think Helen might have said it earlier this morning or somebody, but need to define and use common terminology so that folks know we're talking apples to apples, not apples to oranges or apples to grapefruit. So I do think some of that vernacular would be helpful to, to focus on. Um, you know, these are not quick fixes in terms of, well, let's just go out and do one. It takes a lot of time, a lot of thought, a lot of questions, a lot of planning to pull one of these together with clearly identified goals in advance. Um, clearly, access is a huge factor. If you can't get to your sheep more than once, and I think the one strike policy is certainly sort of makes more sense than, like Chad said, they have a road system in the Black Hills of Custer State Park. They can drive to everything they've got. Maybe some of Hell's Canyon were pretty accessible, relatively speaking. So that's certainly a, an important consideration. Um, one thing that I think this, following up the June of 21 first workshop, is the continued sharing of the data and the outcomes and the hiccups and the speed bumps and the successes and failures. Um, I really think um, the public education component is huge. You know, Helen talked about with the First Nations people and, you know, some of them, in some of those populations, there might be three or four animals left. And it's like, no, you're not killing the last three or four. These were here when our forefathers were here. But I think doing the right job with the education and explanation and the outreach. Transmission, great example. You know, you guys said it, Bill said it yesterday, Tom said it, Jesse said it. It's been a real effect to share with producers in the province and beyond. So we're all pretty excited when that can get in wider circulation. Um, you know, continuing to publish your findings and sharing that information with your colleagues, I think is critical, you know, whether it's at, say, the Desert Big Road Council, and I'm looking at Freud because the DBC will next be in Alpine in April of this year. The next Northern Wild Sheep and Road Council meeting will be in Alaska in the spring of 24, and Birdwood, perhaps, there's a group of Alaskans working on that. Poop Ferry, I wrote Poop Ferry down. Sorry, Paige, that's just, you are never, you are never going to get it. And then with all the baseball analogies that we heard today, I wrote one that says, you're never going to get a base hit unless you swing the damn bat. Absolutely. You might foul it off, you might miss. Mighty case, he struck out, but he went down swinging. So, anyways, I don't have a whole lot more than that. We're ahead of schedule. Um, tomorrow, just so you know, Carl, in this room, we've got the Alaska meeting at 1030. And then at 2 o'clock tomorrow, we've got the Idaho, Oregon, Nevada, Ion Initiative, same room. So, I don't remember what the layout was that we requested, but some of this... You know, like the owl. Did you take the owl unit, Carl, last night with you? I've been taking it home, yeah. Okay, so, back. so we'll need that back because there's going to be a, where's Brad? Wendling. Uh, he saw the poster out there that said the Alaska Doll Sheep Strategy Session, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's about shit a brick. <laughs> and I said, whoa, it's only a one-hour sit down when it made the poster at six hours and Bradley, I don't recall some people. <laughs> so, um, but the ION meeting is an hour and 15 minutes, but these are great opportunities to get together, you know, and talk about focused issues and topics and, and projects. The last comment I'll make, you know, the Wild Sheep Foundation, we've modified our grant aid funding approach this fiscal year and we pushed hard and the chapters and affiliates and the agency partners stepped up. We're very interested in these large scale, landscape scale, collaborative, bigger projects. And so that's the kind of funding that we've tried to bring this cycle. And so I don't have anything else, Daryl, except a huge thank you to everybody who participated. And then a 
like I said, the beer reception, five o'clock in the Tuscany foyer. And uh, then I think the doors open at six or something like that for tonight. I should know, but I, I can't remember. So, um, what's that? Six for the hosted bar. Six for the hosted bar. Bar at six to ten for the welcome back to Reno party. And who's hosting the bar between six and seven thirty? We are. I I heard P. Just <laughs> 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 Yeah, so anyways, that's all I got, buddy. I was just going to say thanks again to all the presenters. Thanks, Mike, for getting us through the day. I know it was a little bit difficult. Apologize right. to those of you that joined us on Zoom. We did the best we could. Um, yeah, that's it. I think that it was a good day of the professionals meeting. I guess I would, I'm thinking just as I talked this morning or mentioned this morning that we ought to think about doing this again in another couple of years because I think this is going to be an ongoing discussion. So here's another note that I skipped over. And so we Zoom recorded this, but Carl, you're also filming this. So in terms of availability, you know, if you want to go back and review somebody's presentation or a colleague couldn't, I'm not sure, Carl, what Gray had in mind or you or how you can turn this, but would you ultimately think that that's the something that could go on our YouTube channel? And then we can put out a link so people can access it. We need to figure that out, but we will share that. Yeah, that's, Gray wanted to capture the content, so we have it all. And then, you know, it's up to above my A grade, a grade what, what we do with it. But yeah, and the we, Zoom. We could edit out all of these conversations, all of these presentations. Uh, the one thing I did want to ask, if this is there a local repository of all of the PowerPoint presentations and the videos? So I'll make a request to all the presenters to get all their PowerPoints to me. I've got some of them and I'm going to ask for their permission. And so I ask those of you that are in the room, if I can post those low probably low res PDF. yeah, PDFs on our um, website. Most of them are on Mike's computer. Yes, and I've got them too. So anyway, the answer to your question is I'm going to work on that. Okay. Yeah, because Kevin, if, if we produce these videos, the way I produce them is I embed the actual PowerPoint slides. So anyway, so I need to have that original contact. Okay. Okay, we'll work on that. So yeah. we'll make that request. I'm saying we're adjourned 20 minutes ahead of time. The buses you know, you all leave and uh, find the sign up sheet. Oh, the sign up sheet. Where'd the sign up sheet wind up? Yeah. Just for CD credits, or do you guys want to? Yeah, no, well, I think the <laughs> Yeah, I've got a stop.